folks, good morning and welcome to Hong Kong U. Uh, my name's Ian Holliday, I'm the Vice President for Teaching and Learning. It's a pleasure to welcome everybody today to this symposium on flipped classrooms. At Hong Kong U, flipping the classroom has been a grassroots movement of TNL change. Uh, it's something that we haven't really uh, promoted very much strategically from the center. It's been, it's been individual teachers in their classes, uh, flipping the class and seeing what happens. And I think now is a great time for us to come together and learn from each other about what it means, what is the, what is the concept of flipping, how does it work, what are the, the nitty gritty logistic, uh, logistical dimensions of flipping the classroom, and how to really deliver for students in classes from this new practice. So the people you're gonna meet today are really the leaders of the revolution here at Hong Kong U, Rick Lofchesky, Ricky Kwok from Telly, who's supporting just about everybody's flipped classroom here at Hong Kong U, and many other colleagues who have been in, engaged in this practice. And I think that's the best way forward, is you know, we, we've reached that level, I wouldn't say it's a level of maturity, but it's a level of some development of practice, which enables us now to see uh, from the practitioners and also from the students who are on I, would, I want to say the receiving end, but that's not really a good way of putting it because they become the participants in this process. And the precise point of flipping the classroom is that they're no longer recipients of just passive learning, but active uh, shapers of their own learning and problem solvers in the class. So I think it's going to be a great morning. Uh, look, I, I've, I'm, I'm going to be sitting in committee for the entire morning, so I'm not going to be hearing all about it. But you, you'll be here to hear from everybody who's been doing this at Hong Kong U and beyond. And I hope that by the end of the morning, everybody's got uh, some new tricks that they can use in their class, some new understandings of, of what can make flipping the classroom uh, really the best that it can be for our students. And that coming out of this, we'll be delivering even better TNL across Hong Kong U and across our partner universities. So thanks again. Congratulations to Rick. Congratulations to Ricky. Many thanks for being here today and have a great day. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm sure we have a lot of audience from Hong Kong U today. And is anyone from other universities in Hong Kong? Yeah, and is anyone from outside Hong Kong? Thank you very much for traveling all the way to Hong Kong. Okay. Um, actually having a look at the people who register for this event, we could see we are all from different backgrounds, different disciplines, different universities. I'm sure we will have a wonderful discussion today because presentations from practitioners in different disciplines first. There were eight of them, eight groups of them. And then we will have a panel with students because indeed we want to do the flip learning but how do students feel about it? It's very important to hear from students how they feel about it. And after that, we will have a panel session with all the presenters here, and you can ask any questions you have in your mind. So I'm sure we have a very good discussion today. Um, so as you would know, we actually, when we started, I think it's a few months ago when Rick wrote to me and asked whether I'm interested in joining this team and organize this event. I quickly jumped on board because I'm so interested in flip learning and how wonderful it is to actually meet all the other people in, in university and beyond who are interested in this and who are practicing this and have an engaging discussion with them. So I quickly jumped on board. At the beginning, we thought about maybe 30 or 40 people, we would be happy with that. But, you know, last week when I called Andrea, she told me we have more than 200 people registered. So that's why we have another room, actually have the live streaming. But we don't want to put them there and forget about them. So that's why I'm using this Mentimeter to engage them because they're in the other room. So if you have a tablet or mobile phone or your computer, so please go to this website, www.menti.com. After you get into the website, uh, you will be asked to put in the code. That will be 2398 and 28. There's no space in between. Okay? Once you put in the code and you're there. And pretty much you will have everything in your hands, my presentation, and most importantly, actually, 
Now there's a space for you to ask questions. So for those who are in another room, they can still ask questions through this. Uh, because we have a panel session, so if you have any burning question, you really want them to respond to you at the end in the panel session, you can put that question in there. I thematize them as question on um, pre-class elements, in classroom, in class elements, and after class elements. And if you have question which is not relating to any of them, there's a space called other question. Okay, you can put in there. And if you have a question, you want to direct it to a specific person like Rick. I actually already put a question for you. But it's a practice just to show you. You could say, uh, put a prefix there like Q hyphen Rick. Okay, meaning I'm asking, I'm going to ask Rick this question. I want him to respond to it. And question about in-class element and after-class element. If you want to ask student about that, you can hyphen student and the area for you to ask any other questions, okay? So now, when I last time ran the workshop about flip learning together with Ricky, Professor Ricky Cock last year, we got a question uh, from the audience that is, how can I ensure students were prepared? A lot of questions relating to flip classroom. So one of the solutions I provided was readiness assessment before you go into in-classroom activity. Now let me do it with Mentimeter now. So about flip classroom, using your mobile phone, you can respond to it. To what extent do you agree with the following statements? Okay, one minute for you to respond to it. Here we have five statements. <laughs> Yeah, move to this slide in order to respond to it. I've already put it into the audience page, so you should be able to get to this page right now. Thank you very much. We got a lot of questions over there already and here at the same time, yeah. So we got some responses already. Let's go through one by one. So it's either flipping the whole course or none. I guess we can use it in, for, in different ways, like problem-based learning as well. We can use it in different ways, flip either the whole course or just part of it, right? It's possible. And it's only good for certain subjects. Um, for me personally, I see presenters from almost all disciplines. That might be a, you know, indication it's possible to apply it, to use it for different kind of subjects. But of course, I would admit, for some specific type of course or specific type of uh, class, it might be challenging to do it. And the third one, one has to provide videos in order to flip her classroom, it can be, maybe video is most direct way for us to provide um, materials, but we call it pre-class elements. It doesn't mean video only. I guess there are many other things, choices. Probably we can hear some examples from today's presentation. And teachers have to generate all their own um, flipped learning contents. One of the models we introduced in the last workshop was student-generated contents. That means actually students who are generating the contents instead of a teacher. So that can be the one we can use to flip as well. Now for the last one, the latest buzzword, let me go to another voting system. Oh, already got people. <laughs> Thank you very much, you saved my time. Okay, um, okay, finally we got someone voted the last one. <laughs> I was wondering because that's the name of my boss and Professor Ricky Cock here. <laughs> so we finally got someone here. So John Biggs, probably everyone knows about him, right? Now his theories are not directly relating to Philip Classroom, but I, I would argue his major notion about what uh, it is, what students does 
which is more important, is actually the core part of flip learning classroom, flip classroom to me. Because the reason we are flipping it is that we worry about what students are doing. So to me, that's related. Um, Eric Mazur, I'm sure he's having some impact as well. Because actually, he is famous for peer instruction. That's one of the typical method, instructional method people are using for flipped learning, right? And what about the next one? Maureen Lage. Now, when I'm searching literature, I heard this kind of a, a saying, which is like, flip learning started from middle school. So I really dig into it. But actually, I found probably Lake and her colleague did it first in an economic course in a university before those middle school teachers that mentioned after them, like Berman and Sams, actually. So it is first seen in printing in the year 2000. When at that time, they called it this inverted instruction, like inverting the classroom. Now, the reason I'm putting Graham and uh, Ricky here is not that they are my boss, actually. They are actually leading the units uh, Center for Enhancement of Teacher Learning and Tally, which actually are the major support in this university for instructional design. Therefore, I think they do have impact at Hong Kong U for flipped learning. Okay. So what indeed is a flipped classroom? So I don't think I need this readiness assessment. When you are registering for this session, I assume you know it already. So it means we are actually putting what we want to do in classroom originally outside class and then devote the time in classroom for learning activities so that we can ensure students are actually active when they are learning, right? So last time we introduced several models, peer instruction, team-based learning, just-in-time teaching, and student-generated contents. Um, but why do we flip? So when Leitch uh, wrote that paper, they mentioned in the two, year 2000, they mentioned actually the biggest drive for them to do this flipped or inverted classroom is that they feel like students have different learning styles. It's very difficult, especially in a large class, like cater the needs of each individual student. They cannot pause for one student. They have to take care of the whole class. So that's why. Then they leave the materials to students so that they can manage. They can manage in what pace, in what way they want to approach the learning materials. So actually, that's the starting point where they, they started this. And also, flip learning will give us, actually for the teachers, give us a, a time. Like instead of delivering constant classroom, we spend time diagnose what's the learning gaps among students so that we can address that purposefully during the class time. So, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the uh, top reasons that I found. Of course, according to literature, it will also uh, support student active learning and student-centered learning. But having said that, I have to admit, I have searched uh, in literature for the publications in recent 10 years. Uh, I haven't found really good evidence to say the effectiveness of this yet. Now, for example, the one I'm showing to you right now here is actually a cross-sectional study, which means there are different cohort of students. So the evidence we still have to think about because they are from different years. Uh, they are really different students. But from this test, of course, we can see um, the flip one actually really engage students a bit more. But of course, there will be challenges. One of the challenges that I mentioned was preparation, right? It's based on trust. We assume students were prepared. If they didn't, then it can be a disaster because we prepare a lot of activities in classroom while they don't have the basic knowledge they need in order to participate in, in the activity. That would be a major challenge. So because of that, I want to run another test on you. So someone responded to that. In your opinion, so just imagine this is a course where you provide videos for students to do the pre-class preparation. In your opinion, why didn't students watch these recordings before class? What might be the possible reasons? So if you give a higher percentage, that means that's the top reason. But of course, I only give you limited reasons here for you to rate. So there's only one response. I will wait for a few more.
Oh, I, sorry. I think I made a mistake. It's not. I'm not used to. I'm actually. I'm used to the traditional lecture. So, uh, the green one there. Okay. Okay. I when I see, I do not have time. Okay, that number one. Now let me show you the result I found actually from one of the articles published uh, in this context. It is a statistical course uh, published in 2015. The students were 80 undergrad students from Denmark and the pre-class uh, instructional method was videos, giving students made videos. These are the percentage, these are the ranking of the reasons. Number one reason is they don't have time. So that's what they, they told student, uh, the teacher. And the technical problems. And video is just a repetition of the book. Then why don't you give the students this book instead of the videos? And the recording was boring. So probably it's more boring than lecture, because in the lecture, you can still talk to students. But in, in the video, you can't do that, actually. So another challenge might be the immediate interaction. So because you give materials to students, but actually you are away from them, you cannot have the immediate interaction with them. So today we have uh, eight courses from different different disciplines. They will share with you these areas, like the context of the course, the pedagogy they use, some highlights from their pedagogy, and effectiveness, and how scalable, uh, how to what extent it can be applied in other uh, places. So the first presenter I'm going to introduce to you will, will share with us their experiences in flipping a language course. They are from Center for the Applied English Studies, uh, Ms. Heidi Wong, uh, Mr. Sam Cole, and Mr. Patrick Dasler. Um, oh, sorry. For each presenter, they will have 10 minutes, and we have a timekeeper over here. And in order to give you some pressure to finish on time, because we are on a very uh, tight schedule, I will stand up and stand here very impolitely, just to give some pressure to the presenter. Okay, I'm Sam Cole. Good morning. Uh, my colleague Heidi Wong and also my colleague Patrick Deloge. Uh, we're going to tell you a bit about how we've used flipped classroom solutions in language enhancement courses in CAES. So flipped classrooms, uh, this comes as a natural tendency for us. Unlike most courses in the university, we teach students in small groups of 20. Uh, we are language courses. We rarely well, we never have uh, a full session of, of straight up lecture. So flipped classrooms are a natural tendency for us. Later on, Heidi and I, uh, we, we work in the English and the Discipline program for art students. And we're going to tell you about a couple of problems and a couple of flipped classroom solutions that we've applied to those problems in our teaching. Before we get into that, uh, my colleague Patrick Deloge is going to give you a bit more of an overview of what we've done as far as flip, flipping in the Center for Applied English, uh, uh, Center for Applied English Studies. Now, Patrick's not here today. He's here in spirit and in video. So I'm going to let you listen to Patrick give an overview of flipping in CAES. Uh, 
video. I think that this genre had two main advantages. The first thing is that because we could record the narration and then do the visuals afterwards in post-production, it meant that we could really get the narration perfect and then we could manipulate the visuals um, as we went through the development process. So it, it made it so that we could really spend more time to make a really perfect product. The second reason, and I think the more important reason for going this route, was that it gave us the ability to sort of talk through a paper. Using this method, we could take two texts and put them side by side and really be able to demonstrate to the students what aspects of the texts we wanted them to notice. So it gave us the ability to sort of replicate that teacher consultation that might occur in physical space. So it worked out really well. Once we had these whiteboard videos, then we faced a problem that I think most of you have probably faced, which is, how do you know your students are watching the videos? What we did to address this issue was that we embedded our videos into score packages. The score packages meant that we could ask questions around the video. So the students would watch the video, they would have one multiple choice question just to check and see that they had watched the video, and then they would answer one open-ended question where they could apply what they had hopefully just learned about writing in that video. So the score packages were quite well. And then our development led to looking at what's going on in the classroom. Now in the classroom, we really started to explore the potential for real-time collaboration using online tools. We started to lean on Google Docs and Google Drive as well as Google Classroom. And we would come to class and the students could work in teams and they could all share their work in real time. And then when we wanted to share their work with the entire class, it was easy just to throw that up on the projector, again, in real time. This, this use of online tools in the classroom really created this sort of seamless process where the students could come to class and they could write together in these collaborative teams. And then when they left the classroom, they still had all of their writing and they could continue this online collaboration outside of the classroom. So that's where we've been. Now I think that Heidi will go on and Sam will go on and give you some specific examples of where we're at today. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about Heidi and I are going to talk about two specific issues we've had in our arts, English, and the discipline courses and two flip, flipping solutions for these. Uh, the first one uh, is students come to us with very deeply ingrained reading habits. Most of our students have come through uh, a local secondary education system that's very exam driven uh, and that promotes reading habits where reading is treated uh, as an exercise in data extraction, as an exercise in cherry picking, uh, or one could say as an exercise in uh, reading to confirm one's biases. Uh, where students are skimming through, they're not reading to deeply engage with texts, and instead they're looking for bits of information, either to answer a question, or perhaps bits of information, pieces of information that support ideas that they were exposed to, or that they generated on their own before reading. And we don't see this as ideal. We want students to uh, be able to engage more deeply in important, when reading important texts in their discipline. And we see this feeding through in their writing when they read uh, in a way that's more focused on cherry picking or data extraction. When they write for us, and some of our fac uh, faculty of arts colleagues tell us when they write for them, a lot of their writing is very product focused. It's focused on uh, m producing a text that looks like an argument uh, but one in which students are not deeply engaging with important literature in their discipline. And so our solution to that is to, to bring reading and writing into the lesson uh, so that we can examine what's going on in the lesson and get students to engage more deeply. And how do we do this? We do this through collaborative writing tasks that students do in class. And the way it works, the, the pre-lesson preparation, uh, students are given readings on Moodle. And this is old school. This is probably the most low-tech pre-lesson preparation 
uh, or as about as low tech as it gets. These are just plain readings, no video. And their job is to read carefully uh, and make notes. They are typically given uh, some sort of analytical prompt that's leading them towards a certain type of genre of text that they're going to collaborate in order pr to produce in the lesson. This could be one where they're interpreting a primary source, could be where they're going to produce a causal argument, uh, drawing from the readings that they've read, could be one where they're going to rebut an argument. Um, and when they come to us, how do we make sure that they've prepared? It's very basic. We look for notes. We tell them, you will have notes, and if you don't, then you'll be separated, you won't be collaborating with others, and you won't benefit from that collaboration. They form groups of three or four. They spend about an hour discussing the readings, uh, discussing uh, different ways of reading the text within the group, and how they're going to use the ideas in the reading, or how they've responded to the reading, using their own ideas to produce a specific type of text. And then they move on to produce a text that's typically between 300 and 500 words. OK, so what are the, what are the benefits of this? One, it treats reading as, as a social activity. Uh, it treats it as one where there's a lot of peer scaffolding. Um, the collaboration helps students pick the text apart and engage with it more deeply. And we can see this going on right there in the lesson. Keep in mind that we never teach students in groups uh, bigger than 20. And so a lecture is around to jump in and question any ideas that students have about a text and maybe prod them to take their understanding a little bit further through their discussion. This wouldn't happen if the reading and the writing is treated as a traditional out-of-class activity. Um, it's low tech. The technology is simple. Readings, make notes. Uh, the readings are on Moodle. Um, and we, the most high-tech thing about the whole exercise is t students typically use Google Docs to co-compose. Now, what are the results of this? Well, first, we have given the same tasks to students to do individually, and we've compared their performance uh, on the writing and on the reading, and they typically do much better on the collaborative, on the collaborative writing when they've done it with their peers. Uh, but more broadly, they come away from these collaborative sessions where they've had to engage with the readings, and they have a good sense of the standard that we're looking for in both how they engage with their readings and how they demonstrate it through the text that they produce. Now I'm going to pass it over to Heidi, and she's going to talk about another problem that we have uh, that we've applied a flipped classroom solution to. Okay, so Sam uh, shared with you how we challenge students' traditional way of uh, writing and thinking about how to write. So uh, to come to our courses, uh, although we have smaller class size, we do have many different classes and courses. So students um, who come from different disciplines or different majors uh, come to our, our courses, they need to first understand some abstract concept. For example, what does it mean by core literature and what are bibliographic essay? And we find that the earlier students understand these abstract concepts, the more likely they're going to succeed in the writing. Uh, traditionally, we've used uh, uh, more traditional low-tech approaches to uh, deliver these rationales to them. For example, course guide, which is black and white document, and then we have a PowerPoint presentation, which is more colorful, more, uh, there are more visuals in it. But it depends on how teacher deliver these messages and how students uh, take the time to read and understand it. So we find that there traditionally, there, these two approaches lead to some challenges. So the first one, it takes time in class to explain this abstract concept to students. And then is uh, when, if students are just reading the course guide, it's not very interactive. There's no room for them to ask questions and to uh, really talk about what they understand. And because our courses are, t are taught by different teachers, so there may be a problem of inconsistency. So inconsistent delivery across different classes. So these are our problem. So how do we flip to uh, convey these course rationales to students? So we try this flip way. So before class, students uh, go through some interactive online learning packages on Moodle, uh, like what Pat 
Patrick has shared with you, the SCORM packages on Moodle. So they go through these uh, online learning packages, and in each of these packages, there are uh, segments of animated videos explaining this abstract concept. And there, are, uh, there would be one or two questions uh, in between these segments to, uh, to check their understanding. And then before class, teacher will review their participation and responses right, before the class. In class, what we do is uh, the teacher check the understanding of the content to really make sure the students uh, don't only go through these packages, but they really understand and learn from these packages. And then in class, teacher and student follow up on the responses. So at the end of each of these packages, students will be uh, asked to put down their question or anything they don't understand uh, at the end of these packages. So this is how it looks like on Moodle. So you can see how long students took uh, to go through each package, whether they really complete it or not, and their responses. So in class, we follow up on this and we save time. Um, so the traditional problems, it can now be more flexible because students can take their own time and complete it at their own pace. And then in class, there is real discussion happening. Uh, we focus on what they don't understand from these packages. And then uh, the problem of inconsistent delivery, because now we have the same narration across different classes, then we can ensure that these abstract concepts are explained in similar ways. So these are the three examples uh, from CES, yes, how we flip our classroom. Thank you. Thank you very much to keep it in time. So this is one example about what they did, why they did it, and how it worked in a language course. Now next, let me invite Dr. Rachel Cartwright-Hoy and Dr. William Man-Intran to introduce us their examples in science education. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm Rachel, and he's my colleague, Williams. So uh, uh, we two together, as our course coordinator, uh, we have three uh, are teaching a course, uh, which is called SNC 101 Scientific Method and Reasoning. So uh, we start flipping a classroom since um, the second semester in 2015. And uh, every year we have like more than 300 students uh, in, sorry, in every semester uh, because it is one of the science foundation courses. So um, basically all science students have to um, take our course. That's why we have this huge number of students. And uh, usually we will have lectures in uh, either LE1 or in uh, RHT. So uh, what is the course about? William. Okay, yes. So you can take a look at uh, a few of these uh, extracts from our past uh, exam papers. Uh, so basically the course is really about how you can apply scientific way of thinking into real life examples or you can how to apply quantitative skills into real life examples as well. So for, for example, you can see the first example here actually talks about how I can use mathematics to model the cooling of uh, coffee so that I won't be burned when I drink it. Uh, this one actually it was taken from an uh, old newspaper in Toronto about uh, at the beginning, at back in those days, how people think about maybe mental diseases are related to uh, uh, tooth, toothache. And then I'll ask students to apply the scientific method to uh, gauge how this was studied in this article. Uh, and then this one actually, uh, if you look at the fine print, we're trying to make fun of uh, uh, Mr. Donald and uh, Hillary when, and see how they can apply uh, the different modes of scientific thinking like induction, deduction, and abduction into uh, uh, real life examples. So I actually enjoyed the first questions, like the first examples very much. So uh, basically it's about um, a woman who spritz her coffee in Madonna. And um, like, so we use mathematics to actually calculate like uh, how much time we should wait for the coffee to cool down. Then that is for, for the customers to be safe to drink. So um, this is an interesting example to see like how mathematics can actually uh, not only applied in the scientific fields, not only applied in daily life, but also applied in the legal field as well. Right. So, um, so 
so we before the start, uh, sorry, I mean like before the, the real lectures, what we do is uh, we show students videos. So assume that uh, they will watch the videos before coming to the class. Um, so I did videotape um, using Camtasia. So you may take a look here. That um, so before I so that's uh, what I was trying to do. So. Um, we screen capture the PowerPoint, and then like uh, I can also write on my own with all the mathematics and formulas next to it. And then uh, later on, I tried a new tool, which is called uh, Learning Glass. So uh, it's actually a transparent glass that uh, I can write to it, and then at the same time, you can also see my face, and then the words will change. So when I write on it, you can actually see that the, the words are uh, um, you will, you, you will see the words writing as normal, all right? But I don't have a spectral writing skill. So the, um, that's what we call the learning glass, and um, this is how I do. So the, these are the videos that I, um, that I was taken for the students. So uh, we assume that students will watch those videos before, um, before coming to the, the lectures. So uh, how do we ensure that they will watch the videos before they come to the lectures, William? Yes, we are also a bit worried about they may not be very well prepared. So that's why, for example, you can see from the left actually is one of the Moodle uh, announcement that we made that we send out to the students way before uh, the actual flipped sections begins. And also along the way, actually before the actual flipped uh, sections, uh, I think almost every single lecture beforehand, we remind them about uh, the necessity to watch the videos, to make preparations. Uh, we also try to give them a little bit more motivation by telling us, by giving some peer pressure onto them. For example, oh, uh, about 200 students have already watched the first video. Have you watched it? Are you being let off? Uh, and actually, I also want to show them uh, uh, a little bit more advanced information because uh, maybe around 50 students have already watched all the relevant, uh, uh, relevant videos as well. So are you lagging behind? If you don't want to lag behind, please catch up. All right, so um, this is what we do, like almost every class, <laughs> all right, before the wheel flip the classroom. So, um, so this is kind of funny. So um, uh, before the class, I watch, I look up at the uh, YouTube analytics, so I look up the statistics. I want to know like, how many students have actually watched the videos. So before I go to the class, if like, there are only a few students who have watched the videos, and then maybe I shouldn't go on. But at the end, the result is kind of surprising. Like, um, like half of them have watched it, and half of them haven't watched it. So like, should I go on flipping the classroom? Then, then they have, the other half of students is going to lag behind, right? Shall I? like? If I, so I, I'm, I'm actually puzzled. Like, what should I do, right? So before that, what I do is like I, I go to Moodle and then I have a survey for them. So this is a survey before class, and I let them choose. Like, they have to let me know. Like, I have watched the videos. Please teach us in the lectures. Then they are honest, right? And then, like, I also have the choice. Like, I have watched the videos, but I don't actually understand through the videos. Please explain it again in the lectures. And then the third one is, I have watched the videos. Please uh, stop, stop teaching me again. Like I, I need to work on the exercise and exam test questions. I want to be focused. And then there's another one which I do not appreciate. <laughs> that I have not watched the videos. Uh, please work on the exercise and test exam questions in the class. So um, perhaps our students thought that they do have a very steep learning curve that they can, <laughs> they can actually do it. So. Um, like, I would like to ask you to guess the numbers uh, using the catch box, but then uh, the timer has just reminded me that I only have five more minutes left. So perhaps, uh, can we, like, can you voice out the numbers? Do you want to have a guess, like, roughly how many students have uh, watched the videos, percentage, or, like, what do they want, what do they prefer? <laughs> Sixty four. okay, yeah? Okay. All right. All right. Some other answers you want to catch box? I can throw it to you. <laughs> All right. So uh, basically, uh, not many people actually replying. The, oh, we, we roughly have 340 something students this year. All right. So um, 244 students didn't, didn't actually reply me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, 
And then there are 17 students that said, uh, they're, they're very honest, that, I'm sorry, I haven't watched it, but like, can you teach me again in the classroom? So they prefer a traditional class. And um, I have watched it, but I don't understand, can you do it again? They're 33, all right? I've watched them, so I stopped doing it again. Like, I warned their test exam questions, 38, all right? I haven't watched it, please go straight to the exam questions. I should be able to do it, 22. All right. So you see that the results is actually very bimodal. Like, um, if I do not consider the 244, then roughly I have half half of each. You know, like then at at that moment I'm not very sure. Like it seems like some students they want to work on exam questions, no matter whether they have watched the videos or not. And then another half students said, no, no, no. Can you teach again? I want you to teach. So at that moment I, I was actually puzzling. Like, what should I do? At the end. Um, I actually go through the lectures very quickly because half of them, indeed, I, I trust them, they have watched the videos already. I can read their YouTube analytics. So what I do is I quickly go through the, the PowerPoint. So I don't go through it step by step, but I go through the key points. And then I ask them to work on the questions because actually half of the students, they want to work on the questions. This is what I understand that they, they always ask for, like, I want to, like, work on it on my own, I know how it works, but not like, because most of the time students would think uh, the exercise are disjoint from uh, what we learn in the lectures, but then this is not true. So what we try to do is we show them you can, after learning the lectures, you can actually do it. So uh, William, can you explain a bit about the, the, the Moodle questions that we have? And okay. the, in the lecture. Yes, so, so once again, remember in the beginning when I talked about the uh, exam questions, a lot of time we are trying to ask them to apply the quantitative skills to real life problems. So that's why uh, for the uh, in-class exercise, we also follow the same, uh, the same uh, pedagogy. Uh, so for example, you can see this one is another very real life example about electric bill. And we would like them to, oh, maybe you want to focus uh, the next bill, that w uh, how much you have to pay when it comes next time. Uh, so uh, in that lecture, we teach them something called the difference equations. Uh, and then essentially, they will just have to um, transform this word question or real life scenario into a mathematical form. And so that later on, they can apply their quantitative skills to make predictions or maybe to think about what they will do with it uh, in the next month when the bill comes. Yeah, so indeed many students thought that our course is a mathematics course. It's another mathematics course, but indeed it is not. So we would think that like the skills, it would be very important for uh, every science student. All right, so uh, would the Moodle thing be, be useful? So when they answer the questions in Moodle, indeed it is, it is useful. Like um, for our five students, many of them uh, got like 4.48 corrects. That means that they can actually see these in Moodles. So this is actually another problem that like many, many, many of your classmates answer the questions correct, almost correctly. So please, please, please catch up. So uh, here at YouTube Analytics, you can probably guess uh, when my class test would be. My class test would be uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then I expect another peak would go up before the examination. So uh, this is another one which I uh, may show bigger that like my class test, test is actually on uh, October 24th. So you can actually point out here and then you, you can probably tell when my my exam would be. Yeah, there's some predictive power in this analytics yeah, that, graph. <laughs> okay, that's why mathematics is useful. All right, so uh, so when you say, uh, I'm sorry, I will, will uh, two more slides, all right? So uh, we actually tried, uh, so it seems like your students are not very motivated. So we did try different methods, like Benson Yes methods and um, on, like we form groups and then we give them bonus marks. So like if one student answers the questions, then all the others can also get the bonus marks. So we try to like give them peer pressures, but it didn't work. So probably we did do, we induce that uh, maybe our science students, they're not very motivated. They don't actually want to watch videos before going to the class. And then like, they do not want to be picked up. So like if in the real classroom, if I pick on somebody to answer the questions, they don't want me to, they will pretend that they're not here. I'm calling a wrong name. Like don't, don't ask me, don't look at me. Like, yeah. So, um, so they want the traditional mode of teaching. I'm not saying that they do not accept the new mode. Our students should be like, open-minded, but like the, but the traditional mode of teaching is so convenient that because you spoon-fed them and then they can have all sorts of information like and which can be produced in the examinations as their answers. So this is actually what they want. And then um, they thought that, that one comment that 
I, which left to me, which um, I actually hurts me, that they, they thought that I left them the videos and asked them to learn themselves. In the I'm not. I'm, in the I'm doing the same job, you know? Like, I touch either in the classroom or even do it in a video. It's the same to me. Like, I do the same job. But they thought that I left the learning to them. But and this is not true. So, um, yeah, I would say I'm sorry that uh, the title of our talk is uh, we think that it is a failure case of flipping a classroom, maybe only to our course. Not, I, I, I don't want to generalize. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the, the key message is I think, I think in the end, is, uh, the work seems to be uh, some merits in it, but I think it may still be a little gap for our students to really enjoy the pedagogy. So I do think some more fine-tuning may be needed in order for them to gain the maximum benefits from flipping the classroom. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you, Lili. Thank you very much for sharing your struggles and your reflections on that. I think in teachers, among teachers, we have this center supporting uh, pedagogical design. Among teachers, we are creating this culture among teachers. But probably the same thing will, should happen with students. We should create a culture for students as well. Uh, it seems to me they prefer this traditional way of learning. So that's a culture we want to um, promote in the future. So um, now let's, um, we have Mr. Matthew Pry, who is going to give us a case in specifically architecture context. Thank you. Right. OK, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> I, don't, I don't promise to speak quite as fast as Rachel or, or <laughs> 10 minutes. Uh, obviously, a lot of things to say, so, so people are very, uh, um, very engaged in this. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a case study. This is a, a very personal. Uh, expression. This is about my experience of flipping a Common Core course. Uh, I don't claim any any sort of um, great skill or, or mastery over the over the flip classroom, but this is my journey, and maybe it helps you. My uh, CC course designs on the future. Very typical humanities course. Um, it's about sustainable development. It was a lecture course. I've been running it for six or seven years. 120 students. So it's very very standard thing. The motivations for me wanting to change from a lecture base to another format um, was really about frustration with the lack of engagement with the audience. Uh, I'm talking, they're listening. And that seemed to be about it. I was frustrated with it. They were frustrated with it. The SETLs were had flatlined. Um, and I, I, I was also inspired by what we do in design studio in architecture and also what I, I see happening in the primary and secondary schools and the, and the skill that the teachers there have in engaging students. And I'm thinking, I, I'm missing a few tricks here. As part of the process, I actually recorded all of my lecture, lectures from the previous two years, uh, first as Panopto um, captures and then as uh, video captures as we have today. And I, I have these as a record of what not to do and how boring it can be in class. Just So I, I appreciate your, your attendance here. Um, I also appreciate very much the Common Core Committee for allowing me to experiment with this, where I have no real skill or experience or background in it. Um, traditionally, it was a two-hour lecture and a one-hour tutorial. I flipped. I, I created this structure myself. Uh, one hour of online activity before class, and then a two-hour mass workshop format with no tutorials. The central difference between these two is the interaction between the teacher and the student. In the lecture, I don't, I'm not interacting with you guys. I'm talking, you're listening, that's about it. In the tutorial, well, it's the tutor who's doing the interacting. I'm not there. So it's uh, understandable that the, uh, the students don't really see me as anything other than a, a, a talking head. Uh, we used edX as a platform for this course. Um, simply because Telly told me to use edX. Um, <laughs> I did make a change in pedagogical approach. It used to be a, a, a lecture course about talking about sustainable principles, and I was just delivering a lot of content. I, in the whole process of flipping, I, I, I had this idea that I needed not to talk about sustainable principles, but about how people are using sustainable principles, how they're making arguments within this very complex situation. So we looked at the form of argumentation. Are people writing books? Are they making videos? Are they uh, doing lectures? Rather than just the content itself. And that, that was a, 
um, a very important thing for me. This is what you do to make an online video. You go and sit in a green box. There's one upstairs. There's one further down the corridor. And you sit and you lecture to a television. And you have your PowerPoint slides on the television. And they give you a technician who sits behind the television and plays on his computer or on his phone just to recreate the classroom setting. Um, and you sit there and talk to yourself for hours on end. The, the, which, is, which is great fun. It's not difficult. It's very easy. It is time consuming, though. Uh, editing 90 minute lectures down into 8 or 10 minute short videos is a real discipline. And it is really good for you to really think what is important in what I am saying. In a 90 minutes discussion, what are the 8 or 10 minutes worth of content that I really need to put out there? Very simple green room videos, PowerPoint slides. There's no outside footage. Um, Telly did all the editing, although I, I, halfway through I, I bought, bought all the stuff, the, the computer and the software, so that I could get involved in it. I make a, a small point at the bottom here. It's different for humanities. Uh, sciences, maths course, where you're learning specific things may be a different format from a humanities course where I am trying to develop an argument. So it's a much longer uh, exercise in terms of my making a point. Um, ensuring online participation. OK, we use video analytics. We use uh, questions and tools. And I'm working with uh, Michael Botello on his prototype tool for getting students engaged in the online activities. Um, I spoke to the students about, you know, do you do this? Do you watch the videos? Um, initially, no, the response was quite low. Um, but I use a lot of peer pressure in class. I work in small groups, and I, I get the students to lead discussions based on the videos. If they haven't watched the videos, they look pretty stupid. They don't do that more than once or twice. Um, I run pop quizzes. I say to the students, do you like the pop quizzes, which are really just testing to see whether they've won. And they say, no, but we want them because we want everybody to participate. We want everybody to watch the videos. If I watch the video, I want to make sure everybody else is watching the videos. Please, can we have more pop quizzes, even though we don't like them? Counterintuitive. OK, what happens in class? It's constant activities, very short activities. Nothing is more than 20 minutes long. It's very dynamic. It's very small groups. I work in groups of three. I have tables with two groups, so there may be six at a table. Um, it's very physically very dynamic. They have to keep moving. They have to get up and post things on walls. They have to go and search things. They have to go and talk to other people. It's all problem-based. It's all scenarios, um, sorting games, everything else. And very often, they're learning skills that they need to do the assignments. Uh, many of the activities, as mentioned before, internet-based. So if they're doing a, a word sorting game, uh, they have to sort the uh, pile of words into different columns. Um, based on a particular scenario. At the end of that, they take a photograph of it, they upload it to Moodle or, or edX, and then we can compare as part of a classroom discussion. Um, they like uh, being able to use their, uh, their equipment in class. This is just an example. This is actually an example from a, a class that Gavin Coates and myself ran in parallel. This is another CCT. This is a, a gallery review. The students stick their assignments, uh, their coursework on the wall, and then they go around and vote for each other's work, just like a, an art gallery. You put the little yellow dots, the orange dots. And then we have a discussion based on that. They really like this sort of looking at each other's work. Um, that's very important to them. As I say, the advocacy is a very important part of this, this course. So for instance, I have a, a number of reading responses that they have to do. The first one is a written reading response. The second one they do is an audio response. The third one is a video response. The fourth one is a response as an infographic. So they're doing the same thing, but in, in many different ways. And these are skills that they need to do to, um, for their final project. They make beautiful little videos. These are really crude videos, but as a way of advocating and making an argument within the, the sustainable discussion. Um, they really enjoy making these videos. I also post quite a lot of their, their coursework online. We have a course publication. It's now an online publication. So again, they can see each other's work and they can learn from it. It's anonymous, but they can, there's a certain voyeurism in, in looking at each other's uh, um, productions. I asked them at the end of the, the, the year, 
which of the activities they liked, which they didn't like. I, I have 20, 25 different activities I run in class. As I say, it's very high intensity, it's very quick, um, uh, but I, I got them to vote on it. They like the ones where they are interacting with each other, the sharing activities. They like the ones which have physical movement, where they're actually moving around the class and posting things on the wall. They like the ones where they have to use their mobile phones or their computers. Not because they enjoy using that, it's because they get distracted by other people watching football or playing games on, on their phones, and they want to make sure everybody is participating in class. We're very lucky to have a very large, flex, flat, flexible space in the Knowles building. Um, and you can see this is in the course of one morning. I can adapt it to any shape or any form uh, I like. This is unusual. This is probably one of only two or three such spaces that I have control over in, in Hong Kong. You, I wish there were many more. Here's a, is an example of, a, again, a, a voting uh, gallery review. Um, the theoretical basis, I'm no educational expert, but the theories that uh, appeal to me, there's a lot of intercultural group work. It's a CCC class, it's a very mixed background. The blended learning that somebody mentioned before, allowing students to learn in different ways at different paces uh, because of the, the ver variety of activities in class. The physical activation, the, this interplay between doing and thinking. I think is extremely important, which is why you guys are not learning anything today, because you're all sitting and just, just watching and listening to me. If I could get you up and get you running around, maybe, uh, no, let's not go there. Okay, the student-teacher interaction is the most important thing. Within the course of one classroom session, I have a meaningful discussion with each and every student. I think this is extremely important. I can move around the class, I can talk to each class, each group, and I can have a discussion, and they speak to me, and they know my name, I know their name. That, I think, is why, uh, when we look at the, the metrics for the evaluations, the student evaluations jumped 10 points, both the course evaluations and the uh, teacher effectiveness, which, which are, you know, was the happiest day I've had for a long time. This is going to, last slide. Okay, a GPA uh, jumped a quarter of a point. If you know your GPAs, that's a hell of a jump. That's a, lo a lot of improvement in the, the student scores. Uh, the engagement, the participation in class, up to about 90% attendance throughout the entire course. So I was delighted with that. And finally, my key metric in all of this is happiness. I'm happier, they're happier. And I think, if, you know, don't measure anything else. Just measure the response of the students. Um, and the students in, in my class, they, they said in their evaluations, we really enjoyed the class. We enjoyed being active. We enjoyed being engaged and feeling that we weren't wasting our time. And I, I take that as a, as a key takeaway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You, you said you won't be able to speak as quickly as uh, Rachel, but you did a good job in managing the time. <laughs> And, and you mentioned also, like, um, well, you won't learn too many things because we are all listening. Actually, that's exactly the reason why we keep each presentation in 10 minutes. So we can manage to concentrate uh, for 10 minutes and then post questions here. Don't forget that. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing your experience in class, uh, activity, coursework, and feedback and everything. I'm sure, Andrew, you want to say something? Oh, sorry. That's, you're, because you're here because you're the... Next topic, yeah. So um, next topic will be relating to flipping learning in engineering context. So we have Professor Ricky Cook and Ms. Andrew Chi. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Um, standing here, I'm actually horrified. Uh, organizing such a big event. Thank you very much again for showing up. I was looking at the numbers. I was like, what if they don't show up? We'll have an empty room. And also to be among these distinguished teachers, they are really wonderful examples. Uh, we've been learning from them every single day. And you see two names on the presentation, but I'll be the only one talking because Ricky knows that when I'm nervous, I talk really fast. So we can really maximize this 10 minutes. So. CCSD 903, uh, Ricky and I co-teach uh, co this course. I've only joined the course team from this semester, but I've been helping out with the course design, with the course building since the last academic year. Um, so everyday computing is a common core teaching students algorithms. But instead of teaching them coding or programming, we want students to understand the logic of algorithms and apply them in different domains in their own discipline. So essentially, they're not learning computer science. 
the learning the logic and the philosophy of computer science. So you can clearly see that the, in the direct learning outcome is not to memorize how to code or how to compute a program, but instead to apply those concepts. And as you can see from this photo, this is basically what a normal classroom will look like in CCSD 903. The struggle of William and Rachel doesn't exist in our class because there is no lecture. Every session is flipped. And we made that very clear from the first session. I gave a student a very tough talk that you will be putting a lot of effort in every week. If you don't like that, drop the course. And the result is we started off with 120, ended up with 96. I was very guilty about it, but we ended up having a very good time. Um, so the format is basically online lectures plus class works, but there is actually a lot more to talk about uh, in this blend format. So how do we flip a classroom like solving a Rubik's Cube? You might not know how to solve a Rubik's Cube. I won't teach you in 10 minutes, but we can use this analogy to understand how to, solve, uh, how to flip a classroom in the most effective and very direct way. Um, if we, uh, so we're following these three pedagogical principles, constructive alignment, and a 4C formula for student engagement, and lastly, maximizing the quality time. I'll go through them one by one. Firstly, when we think about constructive alignment, if we unfold this Rubik's Cube, it will look like something like this. And if we attach one element to each side of the Rubik's Cube, we've got learning objectives in the center, supported and surrounded by online materials, assessment, face-to-face -face activities, and instructions and logistics. And just like this cube I have in my hand, once we connect all the sides, it's building up this cube, and eventually we can reach the top layer, which is student engagement. So next, I'm going to walk you through the learning cycle of our student and explain, sorry, and explain to you how they, how 903 has been uh, following this design pattern and eventually re, uh, achieve our learning objectives. So students' learning begin with the online lectures. We will not go through the trouble of, uh, the, the, the struggle of Ricky filming himself talking to the camera, just like Matthew said, uh, but we did it. So all the lectures are online. And after watching the lecture videos, they will need to do some knowledge check questions, and that is the online quizzes. But at the same time, we're not just posting videos and quizzes online. We want to make sure the online learning is a learning process. It's not just sitting there watching the videos. So on the online courseware, we actually have courseware guides so students can navigate around and find out the resources they need. Progress dashboard, they can manage their own learning and they can know what day they're expecting to do what task. And lastly, we're building chatbot and also using forum and email communications, making sure they're connected with us when they're learning online. And then when it comes to the face-to-face -face activities, first of all, if you again look at the cube in my hand, the side of red is always connected with the orange side. And the, each piece is corresponding to another. That means every online component is corresponding to one face-to-face -face activity. Every time they finish an algorithm online, they will come to the classroom, do a classwork using that algorithm to solve a puzzle game. And also, the, all the face-to-face -face activities are linked with assessment, 20% for class uh, activities and 10% for tutorials. Of course, at the same time, we provide sufficient support for these classwork activities. Um, like Matthew mentioned, we really want flat classroom with movable furniture so that we can facilitate students learning in small groups and, feel f and, and be free to communicate with each other. And also because every classwork is unique. So every session we provide very detailed instruction worksheet and very detailed submission requirement. So students just need to follow the steps and focus on their own work. And lastly, with all these elements connected and interconnected with each other, they f help us to achieve and address our learning outcomes. So we've just finished the bottom layer, the white layer, and the side layers. Now we get to the very top layer, that is the most important layer, uh, which is student engagement. And in this layer, if you know how to solve a Rubik's Cube, you know at the very last layer, it's not intuition, it's not seeing, oh, I want to move this piece up, but instead we are applying algorithms. You have to memorize those algorithms to solve the last layer. And our algorithm is the 4C formula. So following this principle, every activity is designed in such a way that there are credit, Every classwork is graded, so throughout the semester, students are accumulating their grades. Maybe you did well in this work, and next work you did not so well, but it doesn't matter because they're all contributing together to your final grade. And this collaboration, uh, every classwork is group-based. So it's, uh, it serves as both carrot and stake. So in the 
on the positive side, they work with each other, they really encourage each other, and they help each other. On the other side, it creates the best thing for learning for teachers because it creates this thing called peer pressure. So it's either the whole group works together and all get uh, wonderful grades, or someone's dragging other people behind and people are gonna be very pissed at him. So that helps us solve a lot of problems and we leave the collaboration to the students. And next is competition. Uh, each group is working together, but at the same time, they're competing with other groups. So their performance is graded on a minor, uh, a minor component of, their, of the evaluation is based on the speed, how fast you can solve the problem. So that creates this little competition and spice the game up. And lastly is co-creation. Like I said, the class works are not just for them to understand the algorithm, but be able to apply it and explain how they solve the problem. So every class work, the result would be producing a video explaining the whole process of solving the problem. And that is when students connect their knowledge from different disciplines, from different domains, and really explain the knowledge and create the knowledge together. And by applying this 4C formula, we're able to finish this cube. And it's solid, it's neat, so you can apply it in any other classes. And lastly, there's a small trick called maximizing quality time. This is not for building the queue, but to help you fasten your solving speed. And that is by maximizing the impact of every classwork. So we all know that when we are at a high energy level, we're excited and we memorize everything that is happening at that excitement mo exciting moment. So we gamified all the classworks. Every week students come in, play the game with their peers, play the game with their group mates, and they get excited and at that moment, that's when learning happens. And next is to maximize peer-to-peer -peer learning. We make sure that as long as you come in the classroom, you will not work alone. This is from classwork, and also this year we introduced a peer essay review. Instead of just writing down comments, they actually get to talk to each other about their comments and work out a revision plan. So we really use the, the contact time to maximize their peer structured learning, peer, uh, peer scaffolded learning. And lastly, um, after all of the skills, after these techniques, we finally complete uh, the cube, and then we can solve the cube in a, in, a, in a fast speed. And next thing is about scalability. Because of our online materials are ready, our in-class uh, activities design are ready, we're able to scale it up. Just like when you're done with the 3x3 three three cube, you can solve 4x4, four 5x5, four, five five, all the way up to 11, however big you want. And last summer, we had two programs. One is a collaboration with Packing U. So we took 40 students to Packing U and grouped them with Packing U students. All of them did the online, comp online part first. And then when we got to Packing U, we had two weeks intensive learning together, uh, doing all those classworks one by one. And another similar program is with AAL uh, that we invited students from all over the globe. They're high school students. And again, they watched the online modules first. And then when they come to Hong Kong U, we did the classworks with them. And this completes my sharing of how we have designed uh, CCSD 903 in the flip mode. There are a lot more details in the course we're building, in the, in the lecture producing, also in the in-class uh, activities design. Uh, we have a lot of open materials sharing our experience. So we wish to share more. Uh, but I'm sure you're all very curious about how students actually feel about it. So I think my talk doesn't really give much validity. So we have invited a few students. They will share their experience in the later student panel. Yes, I'm very good at using my 10 minutes. I'll leave that to the students. And uh, so please also feel free to ask them questions about their feedback and their true experience. And lastly, this is a highlight video from our classroom. I'm pretty sure I don't have enough time to show it. So if you can just take a photo of that QR code, you can watch it later. And this documents everything that is happening in the classroom of Nile O3. And I think I'm the only one who didn't use up 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I start to feel like it's not a sharing session. It's a context about how fast you can speak, right? <laughs> I think Ricky did the right decision to choose you to do this presentation. Yeah. So uh, that's a very impressive sharing about how to apply constructive alignment in the design for the flip learning. That's a very good approach for that. I learned a lot. So the next example will be from uh, Madison. So um, we have Dr. Ming Yin Wu, who will be introducing to us how he used the flip classroom in the Madison. Yeah, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. Is this working? Um, OK, so um, this is, oh, actually, that's for some reason a bit truncated. But um, essentially, what 
I'm going to go through is introduction before flipping, after flipping, and it's actually um, meant to say my thoughts and also the assessment um, that I ran on the course to find out what the students thought about it and also about what I was planning on doing afterwards. Um, so just as an introduction, so medicine's, well, from what I can hear, it sounds actually quite different because the medical students can't pick the course. They have to do the course. Um, so my course um, that I do by myself, um, I get three groups of students, and they're roughly about 60 in each group. Um, so I will see the whole year group eventually, over a period of about six months. And they're all year five medical students, and this is on chest pain imaging, and the session is about 45 minutes long. So originally it was a didactic lecture, and the aims was essentially to inform about different imaging modalities, um, to investigate chest pain, um, describe different imaging features of and the different pathologies and what these appeared like. So the issues um, that uh, was a problem with this course was actually um, it didn't allow deeper understanding. Oh, actually, sorry, I hope you don't mind, but I've just realized this is the older presentation. Do you mind if I load the newer presentation when I transferred it from? Sorry, bear with me. I did think it looked a little bit different. That we have this over here and ask questions about pre-class elements, in-class elements, and post-class, uh, after class elements. And also probably if you have any questions outside this, feel free to put in. And we will pick some questions from there for discussion later. So sorry about that. Um, so this is actually the, <laughs> the actual presentation. Um, right, so let's just jump. So basically it was a, originally a didactic lecture. Um, so the issues I felt with this particular um, session was it doesn't really allow a deeper understanding. I, I essentially just tell the students these are different types of imaging modalities, these are the kind of uh, pathologies, and this is what you might be able to do with this modality or that modality. Um, but doesn't really get them to kind of engage and think um, what to do. Because actually, there's many different ways that they can deal with the problem. Um, and by not allowing them to do this, I find that when I have to engage them as junior doctors, so now they've graduated, and then I have to now deal with them, and they're kind of asking things which are not quite appropriate for the patient. And that's when I started realizing that this is not really translating through, and now they're actually having to deal with real patients. Um, so now I'm thinking, this is actually an issue. So I can try and deal with this whilst they're medical students and give them the opportunity to actually practice what they're going to do in real life, which I'm sure you'll probably all be quite glad about, so that when they're coming through, they're going to be much better doctors, hopefully. So this is the kind of problems that they have, is that all of us are very different. So you can't just say, oh, we're, we're not like all sausages. You can't just all say, yes, so or this group of people, we will just do exactly the same thing. No, that's not the case, everyone is different, and actually each patient might benefit from a different type of imaging modality. Um, and also certain contexts, it might be more useful to use a particular imaging modality, and sometimes the first choice, because it's, say, the most accurate or the least risk, might not actually be the best for that particular patient. I'm not gonna go into the technical details. Um, so what I did was actually, um, I actually... Oh, I'm really sorry about that. Oh, right, okay, anyway. I'm just going to jump to the next, um, <laughs> hearing three videos at once. I, I, did, I thought it was actually on mute, but anyway, essentially I produced six videos. The first video um, just tells them what the concept of this flipped classroom is and what the videos entail, 
And basically, there are five different imaging modalities, and I break it down for them, which is the very basic information, so that they can then engage in the classroom, and they have an opportunity to speak to a radiologist like myself and argue and think why they have chosen that imaging modality for this particular case. Um, so that way, they're engaging with the material. Um, and the videos are about five minutes long uh, on average. So when I get them into a tutorial, um, I basically changed the uh, room format such that it went from a lecture theatre to lots of tables. So they basically sit in these tables and then they discuss the cases and they go through um, answering these cases using the Mentimeter. So I set the questions for them um, and they work in collaboration. I strongly encourage them to discuss um, and to ask questions during the cases. Um, so actually, one of the things I have found is, and interestingly, having spoken to Heidi, she says that the medical students are actually very confident. But I can honestly tell you from my personal experience, they are very quiet. Um, so actually, this is also one of the reasons why I did flip classroom, because I thought that they might speak more. Um, so this is just an example of a question that I, I would set. So I tell them, I present a case, and I say, which test would you choose? And they start answering. Um, like this. I did actually try speech bubbles once, but then what they ended up doing was they started writing things like, happy birthday, Katie, and then I started realizing that might not be the best way <laughs> to engage them, and they start getting distracted, and they start having conversations even on Mentimeter, which is a bit weird. Um, so, um, but anyway, to test how this was going, actually, the three groups, um, I'm not sure about your, the other faculty's classes, but they have to attend, and actually they kind of get demerit points for not attending. So the way I made sure that they answered the questionnaires was they would have to fill in the questionnaire, and then they would tick themselves off the register at the end of the class. So that way I got a very high response rate. Um, so I have the three groups in 2016 to 2017, and the first group I actually gave the original lecture, got them to fill in the questionnaire, and then six months later I invited them back for the flip class, and then made them do the questionnaire again. Um, I uploaded all this data onto SurveyMonkey, but because I've got the free account, I can't assimilate all the data together. So <laughs> I've just chosen group one, who I think is probably the most representative. Um, so we've got 45 students, and I've got a 100% response rate. And what you can see is, I think generally, at, um, which is very much credit to Telly, you can see that actually the videos, they generally actually really appreciate the videos. Um, the workshop format is also quite similar. Um, and this I'm not going to dwell too much on, but I haven't let the, let the videos down. So I then asked them whether this was an improvement. And I was actually quite pleased to see that in this group who basically had the didactic lecture and the flipped classroom, they, over 75% of them agree that it's an improvement. So that was actually something um, that, was, that find, kind of felt good because after putting in all this effort, it's nice to know um, that they've appreciated it. I did also give them a comment section, and they were actually very forthcoming. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those individually. Um, but I'm going to kind of break it down for you. OK, so anyway, so this is some of the comments. So essentially. Um, it was nice to see that actually quite a few of them said we want more time and we want more cases. So it felt to me like they're actually enjoying these cases and actually thinking them through. Um, they didn't, they didn't like the pre-video questions, but the reason why I put in the pre-video questions are really to help them realize that they have a knowledge gap. So that basically when they re watch the videos, they know what they don't know and they try and look for the answers in the videos. Um, but it seemed like that wasn't very popular. Um, they did like the post-video questions, but they wanted it more case-based rather than fact-based. Um, they wanted the PowerPoint slides after the cases, but actually what they didn't realize was I was going to give it to them afterwards. Um, the MCQ, I didn't quite understand this comment, which was MCQs would be better than the system. I think they're talking about the workshop format, um, but I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, but this was my favorite, this response, was remove Dr. Ng from the vi <laughs> is a visual disturbance. Um, and actually, just to, and, to just put, and just to put it into context, um, they're referring to the video, not the workshop format, because that'll be really interesting, isn't it, if I'm not in the workshop. Um, but <laughs> um, but I, I think it does actually raise an interesting point, which is because I didn't, well, you saw the videos briefly, but you can see that I basically stand there for a while, but it does actually kind of disturb their learning potential by looking at it. So I think that it is a valid point. Um, 
Anyway, so what did the students like? They said they actually, want, one of them wanted to replace all pure lectures with videos, which is nice. Um, they did, it was nice to mention the presenter. Um, but actually, the third point I did actually find a little bit disturbing, which is basically they felt that it's the presenter that actually makes the difference rather than the flipped classroom format, which I think is actually a lot of food for thought because it does make me think how much of this effort I've put into flipped classroom, what, has it actually really improved it or is it actually just down to the presenter? Um, my personal feelings is actually I do, I have actually enjoyed the process and I do actually want to keep doing this. Um, in terms of next steps, I was dabbling with the thought of asking my department and the faculty for more time. Uh, interestingly, my boss is here, so I've never mentioned this to her, but now she does know. Um, and then also, in terms of editing pre-video and post-video questions, uh, I was going to provide cases on laminated sheets so the students can see the cases whilst flipping. Um, which I have actually done, and also the increase the number of cases, but also to rotate them, because what I've found is now they, they always pass the cases down to the following years, or the following groups, so they actually know the answers, which is a bit frustrating, and defeats the learning um, from this, and also to utilize uh, the website features to actually find out how many of them watching videos, and from my personal experience, having listened to the others, I don't find giving them less time, and just warning them suddenly makes them actually watch more videos. Last time I gave them two weeks notice, about I think less than half of them watched the videos. But when I gave them 24 hours, all of them watched the videos. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and also just lastly, just to acknowledge, all these people have helped make this flipped classroom possible. Um, and I can't, I'm, I'm very indebted to all of them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing the results from your uh, research. And I'm very sorry you got all the accidents just now. <laughs> Um, now, our next example will be from social sciences. So we have Dr. Gertney Pham to introduce her experience with her flipped uh, classroom. Hello, okay. Hi, I'm Courtney. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Politics and Public Administration here at Hong Kong U. For everyone ahead of me that has claimed that they have a low-tech style, I have a very low-tech style. So for all of you that are thinking, wait a minute, back at my home institution, it might take me too much time to do all of these videos. I'm not sure I've got enough time against the tenure clock, blah, blah, blah. Um, this also might be something of interest. So I used an advanced negotiation simulation in all of my classes. And I did this basically because I arrived at Hong Kong U and I realized that despite my love and obsession with international affairs, not everyone else is as, a, is as obsessed. And I found out from taking my student feedback very seriously, the subtle comments um, in particular, I realized that actually I had three big problems. First, we have a lot of these very, very arcane, archaic cases. So, I mean, here we are in the Peloponnesian War. Students are like, what has this got to do with the rise of China, the rise of India today? Um, we also have a lot of very dense theory, and I insist that my students have to engage with it, because after all, I teach two IR, international relations theory courses. So this is just an apparent summary slide done by the actual author. So this makes no sense to no one if they're trying to study for sort of six or seven exams at the same time. And the most crucial feedback that I received was that students said to me, look, I'm from Hong Kong. We don't have our own independent military, obviously. We're part of China. We don't have a foreign service. We're part of China. So how does this actually make sense for me as the average Hong Kong student? Your stuff is too far away. It doesn't make sense for my daily life. So the one way that I then thought about this was I decided I had to change the way that I'd been doing my assessment. I'd done very, very classical assessment. Lectures, essays, more essays, closed book exams. This was the way I was trained. So I then realized, okay, I need to switch this around. So now what I do is I write a scenario taken from real world crises, ongoing right now today. Um, and I specify the stakeholders in the crises. So for example, the six party talks to deal with the nuclear proliferation question on the North Korean Peninsula. I also include a track two element because in my common core classes, nursing, um, medical, 
dental students have a lot to say about the medical-related problems going on in the Korean Peninsula, bird flea-related, etc. Um, I have a case study about the UN's question about how it intervenes into the famine crisis in South Sudan. Again, for many of the public health practitioners, this seemed to be a lot more engaging. And then a classic international relations one about the use of military force to intervene in Syria. So these are all live, ongoing, turn on BBC, open the SCMP, you're going to be looking at this as real news. Um, across a variety of courses within my faculty, within the Common Core, and again at the graduate level. And the single objective the class has, after they're given a one-page brief, that's it, everyone gets the same brief, everyone is assigned into a group team, they then assign their individual roles, and they hear one 10-minute presentation by me on the background of each of these whatever their simulation will be, that's it. Um, then their single goal is they have to actually get to one joint statement. So classes have been as small as 28 students, as large as about 150 plus. They have to get to one single page document of consensus. And of course, this is all rigged to make sure consensus is hard to achieve. So, the main characteristics of this approach, it is truly student-led learning. I will show you a couple of photos of what it looks like when the negotiations are going. You will notice I'm not in any of the pictures. Um, my role has switched to become a facilitator, an observer, recording their practices, prompting them with questions. Does any of the theory help you engage? Does any of the theory promote your efficiency in getting to yes? Um, but I've pretty much left the ability to be at the front of the classroom, and I'm now moving and roving around with a team of TAs, trying to figure out how we can help them move a little bit closer to achieving their outcome of a single negotiated statement. It's scaffolded group-based assessment, which of course runs into the free rider problem because they do not choose their teams. So they have a team of three, four, and five. Every time there's always a group that falls apart before the, the negotiations even begin. Um, and I'll get back to the correction for that as we proceed. And the negotiations take a full two weeks. So the last two, two, three weeks of class, we basically stop everything in order to negotiate. And again, I'll show you what that looks like. So, as Andrea reminded me, a nice way to make this separation, weeks one through 10, it is my input. Um, mainly the theories, the history, the background about the cases, special issues to do with the context of the cases they deal with. Weeks 11 through 13, it is now the output time, and I'm no longer in front of the classroom apart from saying the basics, i.e., here's a microphone if you need it, I will have a reminder, timer on the clock to let you know when you've got 15 minutes to the end of class, and otherwise they run the show. Um, they focus on negotiations, so for weeks 11 and 12 on a 13-week semester, they're negotiating full-time in every lecture and every tutorial via WhatsApp, via Facebook, around the clock, whatever means they determine. And then we do a debrief um, in the last week of class, in week 13. So it is only flipped towards the end, the full flipped mode. So again, just to sort of highlight how this is done, it's all scaffolded it in briefly, um, sorry, throughout the whole course. So week six, they get the simulation background briefing. The scenario about what exactly the contours of the six-party talks, the North Korean nuclear peninsula problem will be. They'll get that one-page briefer. They hear my um, PowerPoint-based presentation. We watch the YouTube videos. We have a bit of discussion amongst all of us. They are then given out to their groups. We then figure out who is who, because in a big class of 150, you cannot assume by week six they all know each other. And then the students are left with this huge task now of figuring out what they actually have to do. So welcome to real life where you're sort of given a brief by your boss perhaps and then this is kind of it. Um, and they have to write a policy paper. So if you're a team, I don't know, team North Korea, what are your objectives um, in dealing with these six party talks as everyone's gonna come at you about the denuclearization problem. Um, by week eight, they submit this policy paper so it's a very tight turnaround, and I've got very clear guidelines for what that is in the syllabus. Week nine, that policy paper, pardon me, it's a typo, it's a policy paper that gets graded. We discuss feedback during lecture, um, during tutorial, and then they start to negotiate. We typically do an opening statement, and the students like this because everyone...
held accountable. We all have to prepare a two-minute speech, and then sometimes everyone gives their two-minute speech for their whole team, so one speech per team. Other times, we do a sort of name out of a hat, a lucky draw system, but they like this because they've got this baseline of preparation, and off they go to negotiate. Um, I have a debrief session where we sort of do a meltdown about how did this all occur. So we try to figure out how we ended up with the document we had, whether or not anyone found any of the theory useful, um, if they think there are skills that they can use beyond this particular classroom simulation in other courses, etc. And then we have an optional personal reflection memo. So especially for the teams that have had problems, complete free rider problems, four of us did all the work, the fifth person didn't do anything, they typically find this very helpful in terms of reflecting and figuring out what to do. And in terms of streamlining the grading, we can also use this as an extra gauge to try and prompt how we might be able to redistribute the grades more effectively. And again, I can't emphasize enough, this is my typical classroom, so all chairs um, with the little desks on the side. But then this is what the students actually do. They sort of try to move the furniture around. Most of them then decide they don't want to stay in the classroom, so here they are having yamta, trying to figure out, no, for real, I'm trying to figure out between I think this is China trying to sweet talk North Korea and South Korea. They took them out for Gyeongsa down the street. Um, this was not during our lecture time, but they'd done the negotiations, figured they'd hit 11.20, hadn't got to where they wanted. They figured they'd, that they'd do a set lunch together. Um, they often, this is just the Team US trying to get back on track again, sitting outside on the green. And this makes me so happy to see that they're all out and about learning as effectively as they determine, not by what I say. So again, the effectiveness about this approach, bridging the gap between these sort of big abstract theories, um, it improves their own critical thinking that they have to determine how they think is the best way to reach yes. And again, this use of multimodal student-led learning as Matthew and others have said. So all of these great benefits, skills that Hong Kong U pushes them to have by the time they graduate. Again, I measure effectiveness based on student feedback. I've only had one or two bum comments about, I hate negotiating, I don't like my classmates. For the most part, it's normally quite um, supportive that the simulation is a huge amount of work, but I actually learned something versus what I thought I was doing before, just reading dry theory. Um, the last two slides. Um, the important things to think about, at least from my own experience, sort of trying to figure this out along the way, is having a functional grading rubric and alerting students to what this grading rubric looks like. Um, so I'm happy to talk about this during the Q&A, but this has been sort of one of the key things in terms of aligning their expectations. Again, having the additional teaching support to observe and record, the best metrics I've had is 50 students to one teacher TA role so we can actually circulate and move around the room. Um, the workable classroom, the fixed seating really does become a problem. That comes up as a complaint. If we had a room like this, they don't like this, they can't get in and see each other. And of course, noise management. 150 people talking at once gets loud. So, future applications, at least from my own small perch as one teacher using this now, I'm looking at an inter-university collaboration with Yale and US, and I'm also going to be making the pitch, my boss is not here, um, but I will be making the pitch to talk about whether or not I can scale this up to our capstone students, which are all fourth, fifth year graduating students, if we can offer an advanced negotiation simulation instead of the purely essay-based format that our department uses at the moment. So thank you very much for your attention. And again, this is truly low tech. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Courtney, for uh, mention time very well and also a very a new example of flipping class as part of it and also as low tech one. Um, so here we have another example from dentistry, um, Dr. Mike Botano um, sharing with us his experience with flipping classroom. Great, lovely. Uh, sorry, I thought we had that loaded. It was there somewhere. I looked at do it by date.
Great, lovely. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Botello from the Faculty of Dentistry, and I'm here to chat about kind of, uh, you know, fitting in with the flipped uh, classroom thing. Uh, but really what we're looking at doing is what I originally started with many years ago uh, was actually trying to create more interactive teaching and learning, which is what Matthew was talking about. With the monologue scenario, you don't get a lot of interactivity, and that kind of, like, really got me below the belt. And it was only when I went to a CTL workshop in 1997, no, 1995, 96, when I first got here, that I learned about how to really go about making things more interactive. And so therefore, I, over time, came up with this as an approach for what I wanted to do in my teaching and learning environment. Just to give you a little bit of context about what I'm doing and what my... Um, uh, uh, the, the overall presentation, I'm going to be looking at my learning context, and my use of worksheets as a focus for learning, and expectations and how we manage the student body when we're undertaking this teaching and learning, and also uh, videos, and I use them in a slightly different way. My learning environment is very different. I work in a simulation laboratory where I teach my prosthodontics course in the fourth year. It's very content specific. I have key skills and knowledge sets that I want them to master. There's no uh, humanities type approach to things. I want them to master a body of knowledge. So my learning objectives, uh, it's content driven. There's specific learning goals that I'm uh, uh, achieving that I'm wanting the students to be able to master. It's moving up Bloom's taxonomy. I've kind of like rearranged this because I've included things about diagnosis and treatment planning that I want my students to be able to achieve in the simulation laboratory. So what do I do? I use uh, worksheets that I use for students. They have questions, there's photographs on them, there's problem statements or case scenarios. And you can see there, it's a very messy environment, but it's flat. There's a lot of stuff going on in there that you've got. You've got mannequin heads, you've got drills, you've got suctions. We do have monitors there. There are microscopes hanging down from the ceiling. Uh, why do I use worksheets? Well, I use them as a focus to guide and cover content. Uh, I use it for students to uh, be able to work in in small groups such that it's interactive. Um, the number one thing, which is, I think is what everyone's doing, it allows me to check their understanding, but also in a large class it allows me to do standardize the content delivery. In the past we had lots of tutors working in a large class. When I use this approach I can standardize the content delivery. And also I'm getting to higher order thinking skills because my course is in the fourth year, but they apply this on their patients in the fifth year. So therefore I'm also wanting to give them some clinical judgment skills, but they're learning that in the non-clinical environment. So how do I use the worksheets? Well, I give them out in each session. They're homework. I say it's homework, and I ask them to complete it and write it down for the next, uh, for the next session. And I ask them to write it down, and there's a reason for that that I'll talk about later. In the next session, during the three-hour session, we have a time whereby we do the worksheet debriefing. The students start off with some uh, small group discussion. They have about 20 to 30 minutes to clarify their answers with their peers, check meaning, and they can peer teach if there's anything that they haven't understood. Because I, uh, these are specific questions I'm wanting to, them to get to. After that, I do the whole class debriefing. And that takes about 40 to 60 minutes. And therefore, that's when we have the dialogue moment where I'm checking their levels of understanding. Um, so therefore, this is uh, an old-fashioned approach. It's slightly modified with my son, Aaron, who added one in there, which is the ink. That's the most important one that I want the students. Ink means write. I want them to write something down on the worksheet because I want them to commit their answer, what they agree on is right at that moment, what they think it is. Because I want them sometimes to get it wrong, because when you get it wrong, I think you learn it better than if you just get it right. Whereas if you don't write it down, you get some students who are non-committal and they don't want to write anything. They just want you to tell them what it is. And that's kind of like sitting on the fence. So I do tell them that I want them to write it down and I tell them why I want them to be able to do it. So the sort of worksheets that we use, uh, this one I dug out this morning. This is from 1998, uh, so it's a bit of a relic. Uh, but this one is just pure text. It's question-based. It's going at remembering, there's a bit of understanding, and I'm getting them to the level of critical thinking using this worksheet approach. Then there'll be situations whereby there's particular content that I want them to cover. 
This here, I says, the aim of this is for you to learn about resin bonded bridge nomenclature and classic design principles. Please write down all answers to the questions. These are getting to slightly higher levels of analysis and problem solving with regards to what they're seeing. The next one is what I call synthetic clinical experience. This is where I'm wanting them to learn clinical skills and judgment and decision making and diagnosis, not in the clinical environment, but in the simulation laboratory. That allows me to standardize what it is that they're achieving. So this is a, so here we have some photographs with regards to clinical judgment and decision making. Okay. Uh, and then I also do an in-class assessment, assessment for learning. This one they do in the class, they do it in like an exam condition. Uh, then at the end we sit down and we just walk through the answers and I give them the debriefing. I go around asking them individual uh, what uh, their answer is to those questions. But that's at the end of the course. Um, expectations and classroom management. It's new and so therefore there's some challenges involved to this. So what the first thing I do on my manual that's printed and giving out to the students, I give them expectations that I want them to see, that I want them to get ready. What they need to read before they come into the class. And I want to tell them what time the class starts. It's, not, it's 9, not 9.04. I'm sorry, I'm a bit of a control freak. Um, I also, uh, inside, when I tell them about their required commitment to the course, I tell them that they're expected to be on time, that they're required to complete the worksheets, and I ask them not to use media devices for social media because it distracts those sitting next to them. And so I never say, I don't want you not to use the phone, I say it distracts the other. If you want to distract yourself, that's fine, but I don't want it distracting the others. I also talk about pedagogy. Uh, so here I mentioned that, you know, teaching and learning that do does not engage students in the learning process does not encourage deep learning and understanding, rather like what Matthew was saying earlier. And so I talk about pedagogy with regard uh, to the students. Uh, in the manual, I also have a little section where they can reflect on new things that they've learned or if they've had what I call an aha moment. And when I'm uh, uh, scene setting for the debriefing, um, I ask them to be on task, be in the moment, and I do tell them that I've got high expectations for good participation and learning. I think when you do that, it kind of gets their attention. I tell them to switch the phones to education mode. That means when I'm talking, their phones don't work. They don't know that, but you, I've got an app that controls all their phones. Um, <laughs> And if they do start talking, then I walk up. If they do start using their phone, I will walk up to them. I don't say anything. I just walk up to them. I don't look at them. I just walk up to them. They stop. Nonverbal communication. It's amazing. Um, because it's... And you have to be careful, though, because sometimes they are using it for taking notes. So there's a double-edged sword. So sometimes they go, what are you doing? And the student is going like this, tapping like this. And I'm typing notes. How are you typing notes on your phone like that? I mean... Your fingers must be... Anyway, they were typing notes on their phone. Great psychomotor skills for a dentist. You'd want to go to her for, for your scaling and polishing. Uh, there's evidence to say that when people are on their uh, laptops doing things, it distracts the people next to them. So it's evidence-based, and I mention that. I don't necessarily show that slide, but I do. One of the things that I also do is that I video record my debriefings. And I do that because I want to capture that moment because I'm doing the debriefing about content that I want them to know and understand. When they're writing things down in the moment, they're in cognitive overload. And I, I throw a lot of information at them. So therefore, I record the debriefing just on a camera playing once somebody's moving it around, focusing on the discussion. And then it means when they come to revision and they pick up that worksheet and they go through it again and they go, oh God, what did I mean by that? How often do you write things down and you go, what did I mean by that when I wrote it down? It probably doesn't happen to you, but it happens to me. And so therefore, what this allows them to do is they can go onto this video on the Moodle website where I use lots of videos. I use my videos after the class, not before the class. So I use it for later in the fourth and fifth year when they're not with me. Uh, and so therefore, in here, I'll have the question and a timestamp. And so if they get to question two and they didn't understand it, they'll click on that link and the video will go to there and they can watch that discussion of question two when they are um, wanting to do revision before exams and things like that. Um, so getting to the end. So if active teaching is good, just something to challenge you. Is passive learning unethical? 
I think as the vast majority of the course, I think it is, I can't believe that people do monologues in lectures still. It drives me, I, I know I'm doing a monologue now, but this is, <laughs> so I drive me as well, but you know, if I had you here any longer, I'd be doing like Matthew, I'd be moving amongst you and asking you questions and doing things like that. Uh, and then just lastly, Matthew mentioned this, but I'm, um, I use videos afterwards, and one of the things some of you might be use, interested in is we're designing, I'm designing a new platform that is allowing us to ask questions timestamped to the video. So that means you can go, somebody can ask the question here, and that question will be timestamped. You can click on the timestamp and listen to what it was. So if the student says, I don't get that, can you explain it again? You can click on that tag, it will go in there. Then there's spaces for somebody to reply back to it. We're also in building questions in here, which means as you're going through the video, students will answer it, and then afterwards, you'll be able to see which part of the video they understood and didn't understand. Uh, and then also, we're going to do some uh, video tagging. That means as you're watching a video, uh, let's say it's a discussion video, let's say it's controversial, let's say it's whatever, you can have some keywords in here and buttons, and you can click on these as you're going through. So as the watcher, you can say, well, I think that's controversial. I agree with that. I disagree with that. And then afterwards, as the course organizer, you'll be able to see people's comments timestamped across that video. So it's just another way of possibly um, extending the use of videos such that uh, we'll be able to get more interaction before they get to the classroom. And then that means when you're in the classroom, you're getting a little bit further. Great, that's lovely. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your um, time. Yeah, it is indeed very challenging. We have eight uh, examples. We don't want to lose anyone, but putting them together is also challenging because we are talking about active learning, but we are violating this principle right now. So two more, uh, one more, and we will have a break. <laughs> okay. So now here we have an example from law. Um, actually, the, the person who are initiating this event, actually, um, Professor Rick Glavchewski, um, who would talk about uh, flipping a large class in law discipline. Th thank, you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lily. And uh, I also want to begin by thanking Andrea uh, Chi for really doing all the legwork in organizing this symposium, which has, which has grown beyond our expectations. So it's really quite pleasing to see all of you here. Uh, I'm the last sort of presenter, which is problematic because it's followed by the break, and everybody will be waiting for the break. But that's all right, because actually most of the presenters have covered all my material, so I don't have to say much. Uh, uh, commenting on what a few of you have said, including Mike, uh, that we are violating the principle that we are advocating by speaking to you in this way, uh, I, I, it's of course a conundrum, but I have often uh, explained it on the basis that, well, of course, these are very short presentations, so we can keep your focus, but also you, you are all, uh, let's say, examples of exceptional learners and student, former students or students. And we expect that of the top persons in the class. We know that the top persons can learn in any way, uh, but we want to address the whole class. All of you are, I think we're star students. That's why you're here today in holding a university position. So we, we, this is, we can usually you know, get away with this format here. I did for a moment think about running this, this uh, symposium as a flipped classroom, but I couldn't quite see how I could make it work. You would, whether you would watch the videos, it was an open question, I couldn't be sure. So then, um, let's see, I, I, much of what I wanted to say has been covered, uh, but, uh, but a number of things that have been said trigger new thoughts, so basically I will not really follow my presentation. One of them was actually um, mentioned by Rachel and William, and that is that students were complaining that maybe they were thinking, like, you're not doing your work. You know, we have to do the learning. What's going on here? This is unfair. Of course, of course, they do. They must do the learning. And the ideal learning environment from them, for them is when they don't need you, when they don't need you that much. And they should understand that. I think uh, one or two of the previous speakers at Courtney I think uh, made that point. Uh, th they should be doing the learning. The less visible the teacher, the better. Uh, and on the same point, I find that in order for, to make this sort of thing work, you need to consult the students as to the model, uh, ha let them have input, which is what I did in 2014 when I ran a survey through CETL uh, uh, of my students and their experience in learning in a lecture, 280 students. 
and uh, they gave me very important information that I then uh, uh, presented to the new group coming in, in, in that same academic year in September to say, look, this is what your class, your seniors have said, what do you think, should we do this? Let's talk about it, let's see what the learning gains might be. And they agreed to go with this. So we were able to go with it. Once they agree, then they're committed to it and they're not going to complain too much. Uh, uh, on the same point, it's important always, I think, to come clean with your students on everything. Come clean with them on the pedagogy. Why are we doing this? And, 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 me, and explain that to them in a meaningful way, not just in a token sort of way, like this is what we're doing whether you like it or not. In other words, explain it in terms of the outcomes, not only how this will help them achieve success in the assessments in that course, but also how this is re relevant and, and aligned perfectly to what is needed in the future. So this is not about classroom learning and doing the test. Is it in the book? Is it not? Is this going to be on the test or not? But, but, but that the students can understand its value going forward. So, um, that, so I moved from a typical lecture theater, Race and Huang theater usually, uh, with 300 students, even up to 500 students one year, to, so, oh, here we are. And talk about low tech. I'll, I'll be reaching new depths here for sure. Anyone who's ever worked with me knows that, and it's really a pity to have to follow somebody like Mike Patello. Uh, you see, I can't even make it do that, you see. <laughs> uh, am I, can I try? That's me still, but this isn't going anywhere. The wrong one? Am I supposed to do the right one? There we are. Okay, at least we'll, we'll move forward one. That's my class today. So thank you to Telly, thank you to Ricky and to all the team for having secured this venue for me. It's the only room in the university, as far as I know, that can hold 300 students on the floor. Uh, and, uh, and so, well, I have other images and videos and whatnot, which are available, I think, on the Telly website from <coughs> workshops done earlier. But, but the buzz is amazing. Uh, the, the transformation uh, from sage on the stage to guide on the side to students running with the work is, is, is really quite uh, impressive for me. Uh, I think the students may feel that because the students in other courses do not have this experience so we can hear from maybe, I think there are maybe one or two law students here today who will be on the panel and you can ask uh, direct questions at them. Um, but this is just simply not working, this one here. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe you can keep this, and, and then when I want to change it, you can do it for me, okay? Because it's not working when I press the button. It's, it's working at some other pace. So, uh, as I said, my thinking has changed just in the course of this uh, morning uh, about a number of things. So I really appreciate what has gone on so far, and that for me, the whole event has been a success already. I have five minutes left, and I haven't started yet. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't matter. I'll be quick. So you saw the image. You can see how students sit where they're within a group. We, they don't select. I don't want to waste time, and they don't want to waste time selecting. They know they'll be given. They'll look at the Moodle. They'll see where they're sitting. And I, I change the seating slightly every week so that they are uh, not always with the same people. Um, they, they, the videos, they, they watch videos, uh, but most importantly, they do readings. Now, there's, to me, still no substitute for reading. As, as a learning activity, uh, and I, 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 so they must read law. Uh, and also, by the way, in terms of the pedagogy, just so you understand, many of you did very interesting presentations because you're teaching very interesting stuff. But in law, it's not all, not really that interesting. And and uh, one of the uh, pro one of the features of law as a discipline is its indeterminacy. So we don't have models or diagrams or bubbles or anything like that. The whole idea is for, for students to appreciate the indeterminacy of law and that it's really all about arguments. It's really about analysis and arguments. Uh, so that's a skill they have to develop. And, and uh, it was one that, wasn't being, that they weren't developing uh, all that well when they listened to me you know, in a lecture like this week after week. I mean, there might be a place for a lecture in a university in learning. I wouldn't go so far as to say that lectures have no role to play in learning. But they must be used selectively and strategically and not on a weekly basis week after week after week, the same activity being repeated, and it's passive. So, so this is, it has to go, uh, albeit I would admit that there can be a place for it. Anyway, uh, they, so for me what's important is that they do the readings. Uh, and, and I do produce videos. They're even, they're even worse than um, uh, Matthew's, I think. Uh, or were, your, were your good? 
It couldn't be worse than yours. <laughs> but strangely, when I ran the survey after the first year, students said, oh, yes, yes, we like the videos. I said, what? If you, ever, if you saw one, or Sharon is here, she can tell you what they're like. There's nothing much to them at all. But, so, but, but they, have, they do the preparation. I tell them, this is your learning. When you come to these classes, this is it. There's no other you know, way of getting it. There's no secrets from your seniors. There's no clues being dropped about this and that. This is it. Either you're going to become good at this or you're not. Because I require, we only use authentic materials in the course. We only use events that happened as reported in the newspapers. So we have nothing else. We, uh, we have no more fake hypotheticals. We have no more just invented stories where the teacher thinks he's clever in inventing a really weird story. And because students then learn how to become really good at solving his really weird stories, but they don't, and even how to read his mind, because after all, he dropped a clue about this, I think that's what he's thinking. Instead, they're reading a journalist's account of an event, which is not, nothing to do with me. It's maybe selected by me, or they found it, but it, you know, they have to, this allows them to learn uh, independently, uh, critically, uh, they, 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 they are able to connect their doctrinal learning with the events in the community, which is, which is important. So, and alignment has been mentioned before. So students know also that in the, what we do in the classroom, which e each week we solve a problem, what they do is how they will be assessed. And not only that, it is how what they will need to be able to do in the future as lawyers. So alignment is vital, I think, to all, all of this. So we can go to the next slide. See, you see what I mean? It doesn't work. It's not me. <laughs> Class begins. OK, so probably got about two minutes. So I show them the news report at the beginning of the class. I would do not show them in advance. It is now my, uh, it was an epiphany of sorts, a kind of a breakthrough. Showing the student the problem in advance, like a week in advance, this is what we're working on next week, so start to work on it now, uh, produces a, a sort of a strange defensive reaction by the students. Instead of really grappling with that and running with it, they devise strategies to sort of mi minimize the work that they have to do so as not to embarrass themselves in the class. So they get enough so that they can then do the, what I call a defensive approach. By showing it the problem only when they arrive, they know what to read, they know what to do. Uh, they watch the videos, they know what the top, the broad content is. But what, by showing them only when they arrive, they're all on the same footing. They look up, they read it, they read the full horror of it, which is what it almost always is, for instance, in tort law whether it would be something like the reversal of the escalator in Langham Place last year or the firebombing of the, or, or, or of, the, of, the, of, the, of the suicide in prison or, 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 or of this case, which many of you living in Hong Kong in 2009 would know about where a man died outside of a Caritas Hospital because he wasn't yet admitted as a patient because the vehicle that he was in couldn't get through to the emergency area. Uh, that's what, what they read for the first time. Some of them may have encountered, if it's a recent news event, they will know about it, but they didn't know that's what they're going to be examining closely today. So they brainstorm it and they discuss and collaborate. Eventually, by the end of the class, you can switch it. Uh, they reach, um, uh, keep going, uh, they, uh, they, they uh, reach a, uh, an, an analysis collectively in a group of five, and then they either engage in peer assessment of that later after class or they submit it to the tutor, we can, we can uh, vary that so that they get some form of feedback on, on what they were doing. At the break, we always have a break, right? In the, in, in the, uh, as we will here too, I, I promise you. Uh, 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 at the break, I have a joke with the students because I tell them, okay, now I, I take the microphone for the first time maybe in the whole class and I say, oh, one hour has passed, is it now time for the break? And then what happens at the break? They just keep working. Nobody moves. They just look at me like, what? And they just keep working because they're so engaged with it. Then uh, my joke is that 10 minutes later, I say, the break is over. And <laughs> then they, then they kind of look back. <laughs> anyway, so you can see this is the first survey that I ran uh, before, before I ever did this. And how useful do you find tort lectures there? You can see that's what they were thinking at the end of 2015. Not really a ringing endorsement of my lecture, of my lectures. It was all right, but you know, somewhat useful. OK, so then we move on. Would you prefer to spend class time? Yeah, let's do something else. OK, so this is just an abbreviated form of the survey results. Now the next slide. Uh, is there any other way time can be spent? Oh, discussing difficult points, pre-recorded lectures, can deal with more questions, etc. Again, next slide. Sorry about this. Sorry, I'm back. Oh, do you want to see this? Can we have time for this. This is very interesting. Can you make that work? Put that on. <laughs> 
if that works, I didn't even. Oh, but we can't see it. Oh. Yeah, sometimes when you're reading oh, what a pity. you think you know the concept, but you can't actually... This is at the end of the very first ever exactly. class. Yeah. I think it's very rewarding as well, because... It, and I think it differs from tutorials, as in it's really discussion between the classmates. Mm -hmm. like in tutorials, it's like when you answer a question, the tutor will give you feedback, but now it's like a, a little bit challenge between you and your classmates. Mm -hmm. Like When you talk about your... Uh, arguments and then they will give you feedback and what they think and sometimes they actually supplement you with their knowledge that maybe you haven't okay. read about that okay. in the Okay, book. go to the next um, slide. So yeah, that's the tutors. Go to the next slide if you can, the next slide. You could, these are the tutors who help, who, they're, but, but move on, yeah, go to Jen Lee. This, this way you'll get a sense of the buzz. Quite nice, better than I expected and we have a very nice hall lecture hall so that we can set up all no, 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 the that course. video, the second link. Um, I think um, it is a um, very good this. learning experience for the students because um, they can... You can see why I'm low tech. You can see I, 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 I need help. I, I need a lot of help. Wow. Oh well, lecture. we can just, okay, see if it works. Because here the class is just finished, the very first class, and you'll see there's quite a buzz. And it always is, there's always a buzz, really. In my opinion regarding this you see, that's what happened, yeah. It's very positive. I feel that it's very engaging and it really makes students voice their opinions. And one of the best things about this class is that you have to learn to juggle different opinions. Very stimulating. Okay, okay, that's enough, that's enough. On the spot. That's enough. You see, so, so we we'll go to the next slide here. We're, I, I don't want to. So this is a survey a, after three, two or three months. And what I found was 94% of them approve it. They're useful or very useful. Not very useful, of course, for some, they would rather sit in a lecture and do what they've done all their lives, which is take notes or to study and prepare for the exam. They're pretty comfortable with that. But, but so it's not for everybody, but of course we knew that. It doesn't need to be for everybody. It's just that it's the, not, not everybody's preference, but it is probably the best approach. So then the next slide. Uh, uh, yeah, would you prefer to have, so they actually like a mix of lectures and, 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 and flipped class. So this is where I'm sitting at the moment as to how to get that balance right and can maintain some lectures. So that could be, it. I don't know, next slide. I Strategies, yeah, well this is, maybe you can read this later, but you, a lot of you have gone well beyond this. Uh, you know, about how to style videos and that they shouldn't be long, they should be very short. And in my case, uh, I was told by uh, the telly people, don't wear a striped shirt when, you, when you're doing the videos because a striped shirt will be somehow distracting. And whatever you do, don't have a plant behind you every week when you're doing your videos uh, because then the students tend to watch how the plant is growing week to week and it's kind of distracting. So, 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 so there you are. Uh, I'm not happy with my videos. I'm not, I'm not happy with... Uh, uh, with uh, the learning activities yet. I, they're good, but, but I want to vary them. I'm looking for help, and, and I've got, I picked up some tips here today. So, uh, so thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much, Rick. To be, to be the last one, thank you. Um, don't worry, you still got break, although we have like 15 minutes delay. And let's come back at 12 o'clock, and we start with a student panel discussion and then a discussion with the presenters. So a coffee break. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, now we are back. So we have shared a lot of experiences among teachers and actually without students on board, it's very hard to make it effective. So that's why we have students here and specifically they are from three courses we heard about just now. Okay, um, I will start uh, to invite them to introduce themselves and also the course they're in, uh, involved. And then uh, particularly after that, I will invite them to respond to some of my questions. 
and then I will leave it open to you to ask whatever question you are interested. Be probably as a practitioners who have done this in your course, you want to know how students feel about it, or for the ones who haven't done yet, you might be curious about some questions you want to direct to students. Okay. Now, first, I would like to invite you to introduce, maybe in turn from here, uh, your name and which course you, uh, you, you were involved. Hi, uh, I'm Yaya. I'm a year five medical student. So he's from Maine's class, probably the medicine class, right? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, hello, I'm Gina. I'm in first year here, and I'm in the CCHT 9003 class. Hi, my name is Ram Noor Singh. I'm in CCHT 9003 class. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nicholas. I'm in a Rick's tort law class, and I'm also in Ricky's uh, CCHT class. Hi, my name is Sharon. I'm a year two law and literature student, and I'm in Rick's tort law class. Thank you very much. So my first question was, would be, uh, how do you like flipped class, flipped classroom? So don't worry if you have negative feelings, you can just feel free to say that. I, I, we are happy to hear that. So you don't have to uh, necessarily take turns. So whatever came up and you want to say, just you know, start talking about it. Um, I think it's a good idea, especially for clinical year medical student, uh, because well, basically, um, you know, one problem medical students often face is that we feel so sleepy in class and we can't really concentrate when there's an actual lecture. <laughs> so when you have a video that you can play over and over again, uh, basically you can just pause and type notes and then pause. And when you forget something, you can just go back uh, and yeah, uh, watch it again. And another thing is that, um, uh, so, so for, flip, for, for flipped class, uh, for the actual class, we would have you know, some questions and maybe a more clinical discussion. And I think that's quite relevant to clinical year medical students because basically we can apply the knowledge to, uh, to those questions. And essentially medicine is uh, you know, a science and an art that requires a lot of applications. So uh, doing questions is uh, very useful, especially when we have a professor that uh, you know, would guide us to answer the questions. Uh, it would be more useful for us to just uh, search for the answers in a question bank or textbook. So in general, I think it's a good idea. Um, well, I think because I'm the first year student here and I'm taking a CC course, I, and I think that flipped class is like uh, really good for a CC course because uh, it's not like professional courses, uh, not like um, um, uh, not requiring a lot of very very professional knowledge. It's just introducing us about this, uh, like this field, and making us interesting, making us interested and engaged in it. So flipped class is really a good format for this because we uh, discuss and also discuss with our groups and figuring out uh, problems together, which makes us like really engaging in this course, uh, rather than just listening to the teacher simply talking about this. So it get me very interested in this course and also in this everyday computing things. And um, so I think this is a very good format. Another thing is that um, by flip class, actually, I think uh, it gives us a very good like opportunity for us to um, like discuss in class, so that if we have problems, we can like timely con timely consult the professors and also the tutors um, to get our uh, discussion more efficient. More efficient. So I think generally, it's also a very good way of teaching. Oh yeah. So I don't know if you know this, but the class I was in was held on Saturday morning, <laughs> and I didn't miss a single one of them. So, I mean, that just, I think, shows that flipped classroom has been an effective format. Primarily because the course that I was taking was everyday computing and internet. And in that, it was basically the application of algorithms in solving problems, right? So, in that, I think the main point is problem solving. And the flipped classroom environment actually allowed me to solve the problems in the classroom, in the presence of tutors, and that helped me. Although, like, if I have to suggest an improvement, I'll say that the videos, they are definitely useful. But even after that, there has to be some interaction between the teacher and students, right? So maybe the flipped classroom can be like a combined effort or something, maybe where we can have like an initial 20 minute buffer period where we can consult the teachers, ask questions, and then the problem is given to us. or. I don't know, it can be done like a week before where, so that we have like a week to process the new information that we get, right? Something like that. Other than that, I definitely believe that 
the CCSD 903 course is like one of the best courses that I have till now, one of the most interesting ones, and I didn't miss any of the class because of F classroom. Um, uh, for CCSD class, I pretty much agree with what he said. Uh, basically, uh, we, the good thing about doing a flip class is that we get to learn the things we're supposed to know before we come to class, and then in class we actually get to do all these activities, which is a lot more, which makes class a lot more fun. Uh, but uh, in terms of law, uh, I think that flip classes are useful because we get to exchange ideas between our group members in terms of how we're supposed to analyze that case and uh, produce a comprehensive analysis of what's happening. Uh, and I think the support from tutors, like they give us ideas on how we should go. They give, give us pointers. And I think that's really useful in terms of our like, uh, overall, overall development in terms of for exams and uh, the future technical skills which we have to have as a lawyer. Yeah, um, like also, I guess I'll address like the tort law flip class. I am all about it, like I love it. Mainly because of three reasons. The first is, um, I feel like for me to be enthusiastic with my studies, I sort of need to see my professor being enthusiastic about his teaching. And I feel like when I see Rick do the flip class, I, I sort of know that he cares about us. And I think he knows like a lot of our names. At least like in our group, he knows everybody. And I feel like being, like being able to have this interaction where I know he actually values my opinion or our group mates' opinion is actually very important. Um, and also, it gives us like an opportunity to interact with our classmates. Like in other lectures, we don't really get to speak to anybody. I have another like class that's only 40 people, but it's a three-hour lecture, and I don't know anybody else except the person next to me. And I feel like that's a shame because in law, we don't get to choose our classes either. So we should actually know everybody by our second year, but we don't. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I feel like law can sometimes be a little bit vague. Like we don't really know what it is. But if we get to apply it to like a real life scenario, it makes it a lot more accessible. And I feel like a little, I feel a little bit more secure about practicing if I get to at least apply it in a real life case. And then thirdly, I also feel like flip class actually helps our assessments better because we get to interact and we have feedback on like what we think of the law case. And that's very important when it comes to knowing what to do in our assessments. So it makes me at least less nervous. I'm usually very nervous about my exams, but the flip class helped me like feel a little bit more secure in knowing what to expect from our like um, assignments. Thank you very much. So I wonder, in your experience, did you came did you come across any challenges in learning when you experienced this flip class? I'm sure you have other type of courses going on, right? When compared with them, what kind of a a challenge specific relating to flip class have you experienced? Or is any? Maybe there's no. I think the key challenge that I faced in my law flip class was that uh, uh, there, there actually isn't a lot of challenges because we actually have a really thick textbook this thick to like com uh, complement the videos. So basically we can understand all the theories behind how we're supposed to apply uh, the test. But, uh, when it comes to like real life application, we don't know where to put which, uh, which test exactly. So that might be a challenge for us. But as for the CCST course, uh, basically, my key challenge was that uh, I, at some points uh, the video content became quite technical. So I had to look up on Wikipedia or other Google, Google other sites in order to like fully comprehend the material in order to like complete the task which I had in hand during courses. I think another thing about flip class is that um, it kind of depends on the quality of the videos. Uh, and uh, I mean, if I, I guess if if uh, the the video, uh, for, for example, if the professor in the video is very um, like monotone, then essentially uh, you, you kind of uh, fall asleep. But then, uh, if it's very well done, then it can be very engaging. So, uh, well, it's, it's, I know it's very difficult to make a video. Uh, but then, uh, because actually uh, in the medical campus, uh, uh, there has been some effort to put into the flip cl flipped classroom, and I've experienced similar, like, uh, watched videos from uh, more than one professor, and then you can kind of see, uh, you know, sometimes you feel more sleepy, and sometimes uh, you're, like, more engaged. <laughs> and, uh, and because a uh, flipped classroom, uh, to watch the video, um, it requires a lot of self-motivation because if you actually have an actual lecture there, you go there and you force, force yourself to be more concentrated. But then um, 
watching a video at home, uh, sometimes you kind of, you know, just want to relax. And uh, in the end, uh, you, you might not have the same mo motivation as you get in an actual lecture. But if you do sit down and watch the video and you go to the uh, flip classroom, uh, then uh, it's very rewarding because you know you can apply the knowledge and then when you can answer the questions, you know, oh, I've grasped some of the key uh, knowledge there. So uh, there's like uh, uh, pros and cons about this idea, I think. Um, I think, uh, well, the main challenge is that uh, during normal classes, making a comparison, like during normal classes, I just come and sit there and listen. So if I don't understand it, and that's it. And when I'm doing assignments, and I found that I didn't understand those in classes, I just talk to my friends. Maybe I can talk them, uh, talk to them for a whole afternoon, and re uh, arrive at a conclusion that we may both don't understand that. <laughs> yeah, and that's uh, not about flip, flip classes because uh, during flip classes we have to make make sure that ourselves um, that uh, watch the previous videos and then like understand what the knowledge is to get our projects or our discussions going on. And during the flip classes, we are, uh, we actually have the pressure to finish our projects within a time period because we have grading on the time time complex. So. I think it's like a challenging for us to make sure we get the knowledge and we can apply it before the lecture, and then we make our discussion to make our project better. And it's um, the main challenge that I face, I think, during the classes. And although it's a challenge, I think it's also a good thing for my learning because it makes sure that I learn it very well and I don't waste my time during like um, like uh, meaningless discussions. It's like yeah. I mean, if I. I the challenge I'm going to name, I don't think we can actually solve it because it may be inherent in university students. But I do feel like sometimes when we have discussions in our tort law class, there are like, you know that there are people who have not done their preparations. And sometimes like we have a group of five usually and um, they will sort of break down like the whole analysis to different parts. So there are sections for our analysis. And usually it's like two to three students who are actually doing all the work and there are other people who are just sitting there. Um, I, I don't personally see that there is a way to change it because if they want to like not do anything, that it's not going to be like we can't force them to do anything else. But then, yeah, there are definitely issues of like, well, I, I know when I go to the class, it's going to be the same few people who are going to con contribute to the analysis, and the rest will just like sort of sit there. But then, in our normal classes, I, I, I'd rather I prefer the discussion in the normal classes because it's better to at least have some people talk than have nobody talk in the lecture. You know when you have like a straight on lecture, sometimes the lecturer asks a question, and there'll be like 10 seconds of awkward silence and then one person answers. I'd rather have like three people discussing than like the awkward silencing that usually happens. Thank you, so I wonder whether you have any question you want to ask students? I don't have the skill, so. You can talk to it. It is a mic there. Oh, thank you. Uh, I wonder, compared with other classes, how much do you input for the flipped classrooms? And, and, and I wonder, do you think everything can be clear in the flipped classroom with no more input after the flipped uh, classroom? Yeah, thank you. It's about the timing they invested uh, yes. going through this as yeah. a student, when compared with other traditional types. Are you investing more time? And will you be able to you know, be clear about what you need to learn at the end of it? I kind of believe that flipped classrooms are better in that sense because so you can learn at your own pace at your home, right? So that's a good thing. And then while you're applying the concepts, you are in the presence of your peers as well as tutors and professors. So you can ask questions, you can discuss, you can learn from your 
peers. And I think that's a very important process in learning, you know, learning from the other students. So in that sense, I believe that flipped classroom might, to a large extent, um, you know, reduce the time I spend on learning. Thank you. I think it actually depends on how much time you decide to put in. Because, uh, for example, for flipped classroom, so uh, it really de decide, uh, what de depends on how much time you want to put to watch the video. Like, for example, like I said, um, uh, the, the good thing about it is that, you know, you can always go back when you forget something. You, you can type your notes and you can watch it again. But then the bad thing is that because you know you have a second chance, you might not be able to push yourself to be as energetic as you should be uh, when you are learning in an actual lecture. But then, compared to the lecture, uh, in an actual lecture, for example, I mean, if you are sick on that day, then you for, probably you missed the whole lecture, then you can't really learn anything in that morning. But then, uh, if you have, you know, if you feel really energetic and you can concentrate well on uh, during the actual lecture, then uh, essentially you're forcing yourself to probably spend less time to grasp more knowledge. So I guess it depends on yourself that how much time you can put in uh, to learn. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think in, in a way, uh, it, it's a bit difficult to answer this question, but then yeah, you, you can definitely see the good thing and the bad thing about both forms of learning. Okay, thank you. I think Wilton have a question. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you have mentioned that uh, some videos make you feel sleepy, and also uh, some videos are very engaging. So as a teacher, I also want to learn uh, what are the important components or elements in the video that uh, you think is important to engage you and make the, the flipped video more interesting. Uh, okay, thank you. So, so we want uh, to learn from you. <laughs> oh, well, uh, so from a personal experience, I think uh, if the speaker uh, speaks very slowly and uh, without uh, intonations, uh, or because uh, I've watched some videos that you can't even uh, see the lecturer's uh, face. It's more like just the PowerPoint. Uh, actually, I, I wasn't sure whether um, it was officially called flipped classroom, but then the idea was similar. So, but but during those videos, uh, it's more like you see the PowerPoint and you see some pictures, but you don't really uh, see the professor himself, and the tone is uh, without intonation, and that is that kind of makes you feel sleepy. But if, if you uh, can actually see the professor uh, maybe uh, speaking with some body language or facial expression with uh, different intonations, and maybe the speed uh, is suitable for you. Uh, but actually for the video, you can adjust the speed. So if you think it's too slow, you can kind of do like times 1.5. So, <laughs> so that kind of, um, yeah, maybe makes, makes, makes it better. Uh, so yeah, so in, in general, I think if maybe the professor uh, is kind of engaged in the video, then uh, you, the student will feel more engaged as well. Yes, Carol. No, no, Carol, here. here. Is this pick here? Oh, yes. Okay, here. okay. Um, thank you very much for your sharing. I'm, um, I'm interested in the. Um, so many different groups working on the collaborative analysis or some kind of flipped classroom or involving some kind of problem solving, working on cases, working on um, problems. What, what kind of consolidation would you think will be helpful? Like after different groups have their many different way of working on the problem. So generally, I would think that we teachers will need to do some consolidation. I mean, it can be in the form of, now I tell you the answer of the case, but I don't think, so I, I'm asking you from the student's perspective, how would you see will be a good way that we can put different ideas together, the different groups from your experience I mean the, the summary part. I'm of course also interested in learning from the student perspective. Like what's the best way to then put things together from your perspective? Sure, so I think it was really well done in my course. Yeah. In that basically, so they put out a recommended solution on the website in a flipped classroom learning manner. 
So after the class was done, they posted the solution online on the website and we could all watch it. Apart from that, they also gave us you know, personalized feedback on our solution. Mm -hmm. So what was wrong was provided to us. And oh. lastly, they selected one of the best groups among oh, okay. all the groups okay. so that we could actually see the work of others and we could actually learn from them. So I think it was like the combination of the best elements. Okay, okay. So it is put on a web yeah. um, after all the problem yes. solving case are done. Uh, I'm so sorry to say, actually, we only reserved 20 minutes, and obviously it's not enough, and uh, I actually don't want them to go, but we have another panel session with all the presenters. So thank you very much for your contribution, and we hope we will yeah, involve this more in the future. Thank you very much. Yes, so you could ask questions as well, uh, because we will have all the... So please, all the presenters, please come here, and... Um, we have a panel discussion. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, well, what we are going to do, because you have all, yes, yes. Um, we have all questions on the website already. Um, what I'm going to do is to first maybe pick some of the questions from this list and see. Yeah. <laughs> Now first let's open up and anyone want to ask any questions and then we will pick from the platform, the Mentimeter, but now it's open to everyone if you have any. Yeah, please. We have two now, so you first and you will go next. Please. See, Rick has been using this in that very large room, so he's very skillful. <laughs> Come on, you got your eye in. Okay, this one is cool. I like it. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, the major difference between the traditional way and then the one we are saying flipped classroom. Because in HKU, we all are having the module where videos, text, PowerPoints, and then every lecture is posted before the class. And then everyone uh, follow that thing in our room or in our house and then come to the class, discuss on that thing and then explore the topic. This is happening in every class. So what do you think is the difference between that traditional method and then this one? I want to know the main difference because everything seems the same for me because the same thing posted the the video maybe the video the video posted online is you can say different but as long as it is delivering the content i don't think it is different for me so i want a basic difference between the traditional ongoing method and then the flipped classroom in a way it is delivering the content can i address that uh, first of all I, I i i'm thank you for your question i'm not sure that your description of the conventional class is completely accurate because uh, in my experience the conventional class would be would take place in the same way that in a room like this a lecturer at the front would be speaking so students may or may not do their readings in advance but they come to the class and they may they may or may not come to the class but then they listen and take notes that's the typical scenario there really isn't any videos involved in most courses when it's taught that way but the central difference in my experience is that when students, whether or not, however much work they do in advance, they do the whole, because you may know the flip means that you, the homework is done in advance, or the, le the lecture content, rather, is, is done in advance. We call it lecture content. And then when they come to class, you work, you solve problems. It's to use, utilize student time more productively so that when they come to the class, they don't, 300 of them merely sit there and take notes. 
learning passively and remembering and retaining only 3 to 4 percent of it after three weeks. Here they actually engage with the doctrine that they've studied and read uh, beforehand and then they apply the problem. So it's student-centered uh, student uh, uh, learning. Uh, it is uh, um, collaborative learning, team-based learning, uh, and depending on the, how the content is in the flipped class is designed, it allows you to make connections to the real world. When you have the, the famous speaker on, or the sage on the stage speaking to the, to the group, you, he, may, or he or she may be able to hold their attention for the first couple of weeks or the first hour or so, but beyond that, research shows it won't be held. You can't keep the audience and, and they were, their learning drops considerably as time goes on in that course. But this way, they have the opportunity to learn in, an, in a hands-on, interactive, productive way or th that's quite different from an ordinary lecture, I would have thought. Can I, if I, and if I can follow up on that, the one thing we've forgotten about is the importance of the student. And in my class and with my students, I say, I ask them, who do you think makes the best teacher, the expert or the student? And I get a show of hands. And it's interesting to see a third or more of the class say the student makes the best teacher, which is the answer that I'm looking for because I believe neophytes make the best teachers. Because as experts, when you're explaining a concept, and I forgive if you've seen this before, uh, but when you're explaining something, you explain in A to B. And as an expert, you explain in a linear manner in the shortest number of words and concepts to explain the answer from A to B. But learners don't think like that. They think in a tortuous, convoluted, evolutionary way that gets from A to B eventually. Beginners explain in a similar manner, and they explain in the language that beginners understand. So I think the quality of teaching in small groups is better. I can sit back and watch the teaching and learning going on, and I'm going, that's great. So most of the teaching, learning, understanding, clarification, question building, peer teaching goes on in the groups. Much more learning goes on than the sage on the stage. Uh, let, me, let me try to also uh, consolidate Rick and Mike's uh, uh, responses in just three points. The first is the availability of contents. So you make yourself always available so that students can watch your videos anytime, anywhere, learning at their own pace. Second point is the uh, uh, energy level in the room because you guys are all drawn out by the activities. You can't just sit back and relax and sleep or Facebook or whatever you want to do. So then you actively participate and therefore you learn better, supposedly. And the, and the third point is uh, actually uh, the quality issue that Rick points out. You make your classroom time quality time, like Mike just mentioned. Right? Uh, because you are all drawn out, that time you spend in this morning right, is much better quality than just sit back and relax. So three points, availability of contents, quality time, and energy level. Okay, any more questions? No, we're not different. I will run. I can hit a moving target, actually. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for your sharings. Uh, my question is related to uh, the pedagogical principles or technologies or uh, tricks that uh, you applied uh, in the new versions of your course. Uh, what were they? What kinds of uh, pedagogical uh, principles and technologies did you apply in the in this new uh, Spark version of your courses? I don't know, maybe I, I chip in. Um, I, I mentioned in my presentation that I, I changed pedagogical approach from just delivering content, just talking about facts and uh, figures, to looking at how people are using those facts and figures. So as a, as a way of delivering the course really just studying you know, whether somebody wrote a book or made a film or conducted some sort of street protest as a way of making a point rather than just studying the point. Um, and I found that very invigorating for me. A lot of what I've got out of the flipped classroom is what I've learned. Um, I like the small groups. I like, I like the classroom setting because as a teacher, I learn so much. And that... that trick of concentrating on the advocacy and the argumentation for me was, was very empowering uh, and the, one of the things the students said to me which I, I, I was quite uh, telling for me they, they said we know what you're talking about you don't have to keep telling us these things we, we, we understand we watch
watch your video, we un you know, it's not like we're really struggling with some sort of complex equation or something. We understand it. But we like the way that you make the argument. We want to hear how you present this. And then we can judge that. And, and I, I've been developing ideas around that, that, that particular device. Uh, uh, learning by doing, it, it has often been said, is the most effective way of, of learning. And this is the key pedagogical principle at play, I think, in this model. Uh, if you speak to someone and they listen, research shows what little they will remember and be able to do something with. They might be able to write a test about it if you ask them the same material a few weeks later, but they can't do anything else with it. But I think from the, for centuries or, or even millennia, uh, scholars have, have, have acknowledged or have made the point that learning by doing, and you can only ask yourself, if you wanted to teach somebody to make an apple pie and you were to eat it, you can tell him how to make an apple pie, but I don't think you'd want to eat it. If you now make an apple pie with him, he does that, then you're getting closer to getting that learning than, than merely by sitting there and listening. There are other turns. Ma ma many of the presenters, I think, have hinted at them, uh, other moves that you can make, but as I s described, a key breakthrough for me was by simply not releasing the problem, by really keeping this moment of drama until the moment of arrival, and then everybody is starting from the same position. Uh, it actually achieves a lot, but there are, there are other little uh, turns, I think, that colleagues have talked about. Uh, let me quickly build on uh, what Rick just mentioned. We, in our course, uh, as Andrea has uh, presented, we ask students to co-create something before they can leave the room. And that something is exactly an artifact of teaching us how they had such solved the problem. So it's not just learning by doing, it's learning by teaching. So they are assessed by how well they teach uh, the tutors and the professors in the process of solving the problems. And we have rubrics for that. So therefore, they, they really have to force themselves into not just solving a problem, but being able to articulate the solving process in three minutes or five minutes of their videos. So we don't ban their devices, we encourage them to use their devices to make that video report at the end of the class. So I've got a question uh, actually um, uh, regarding the points that Michael made uh, previously. So in a flipped classroom, it's very important that we have students collaborate and teach each, each other. So as an instructor, how do we make sure that they are teaching each other the right concept or so uh, is the debriefing uh, really important in the flipped classroom? Or do we actually, we don't really care uh, whether they're teaching each other the right concept? Uh, we uh, actually, we, ju we just want them to be engaged in the learning process. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, engage, yes, active. Uh, if they're teaching right and wrong, I'm not bothered because at the end, I go through the clarification. And so I do this thing where I, when I go around and I ask students a question, is it A or B? They go A. I said, A or B? They go B. I said, oh, deadlock. Which one is it? I go to the third. Tie break. Right, what are you saying? A or B? Uh, yeah, there you go. That's a, that's a science question answer, obviously. Um, and so then I, then I go back to the A, whichever one got it wrong. And I said, now, do you see, you understand? You had an aha moment. You had a, you've now had a conception corrected. So your misconception is now clarified. So even though they might be teaching something wrong up to that point, more often than they're not, because they're clever students, we do get the brightest students here, and so they invariably get it right. They might have a bit, a bit of a misunderstanding, but that's where you do the debriefing and you're able to clarify any misconceptions. And I talk about that when we go around. Great, I've clarified your misconception. This is going to be one of the deepest learning moments you have because you've learned how to correct a misunderstanding. I... I I think there's also quite a, an element of cheerleading in, in teaching. I, I, we can't think of teaching just as delivering information. Uh, I had a, a, a student in my class in the spring who, who come to class and immediately fall asleep. You know, he sort of slump on the desk and fall asleep. And his, his group mates were obviously a bit put out by this. So I, I decided my role was to help this guy sort of wake up. So I said, OK, let's sleep together. So <laughs> And, and of course, he, he's embarrassed by this, you know, and, and he's, oh, I'm just so tired, I'm just so tired. I know, I'm so tired. I'm so... And, and just, just to be able to sit with a student and to, 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 to you know, just get them up and running, um, I think is so important. Because when, I, when I, I was developing my course, I went and sat in other people's classes. And I, I come out of the, these uh, auditorium, these lectures, thinking, 
students do an amazing job staying awake. Two hours, you know, and I, I fell asleep twice in my, my, my colleagues' classes. It was really embarrassing. But I, it is really tedious. But to, to have that, to be able to have that interaction, be able to, uh, I think many people have talked about energy, um, and that the students want to see that you're passionate about it and you're in, interested in it, and they will, will pick up on that. I mean, I mean, one thing about the falling asleep student, I, whenever I, if I have a student falling asleep, I kind of think, they could have stayed at home, but they didn't. They came to my lecture to fall asleep in, you know? Um, and so sometimes I might tiptoe around them or something like that. Sometimes I might talk a little bit louder, but I remember when I was a student, I used to fall asleep in a seminar of eight students, and my orthodontics tutor would lean forwards and just gently touch me on the shoulder and I'd wake up. So I have absolute empathy for the sleepy student. And we know how sleep deprived they are and everything like that. So. Uh, and occasionally in lectures, what I'll do, I said, right, everyone, get up, stand up, turn around three, and I, I, you know, we do a little bit of aerobics and we get them a little bit, you know, get the blood going and everything like that, just as a break when you've got a long session that's going on. So if you do have a two or three hour thing and you're in seats like this, you've got to build in some physical activity because if you're not doing the run around like Matthew's doing on the board and everything, you've got to get the circulation going. Should we see how many of them are sleeping? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Can I add something? I think, uh, forgive me if I'm, if I'm going to misparaphrase your question, but you focused on getting the right idea of the concept. And in our courses, uh, there are certain modules or parts of the course where we have a definite idea of what we want students to learn. But given that we're teaching humanities students, there are not correct ideas about a lot of ideas or concepts. And instead, we need to be able to step back and let students treat reading uh, even though most of their reading is going to be done individually in the university, but to still treat it as a socio-constructivist process. One where, uh, by sharing how they read, how, uh, and by read here I mean much more about interpreting, uh, how they've interpreted a text with others so that they can challenge each other and get a Vygotskian thing going on where they're scaffolding each other. And they're doing this in a room of 20 in a much more complicated way, and at a level where in groups of three or four, it's at a level where they can digest it. Whereas if it's me talking with a group of 20 about a text they've read and, and, and what I want them to get from it or what they get from it, the conversation is much more simplified. If I have them in groups of three or four and they're negotiating with each other about competing interpretations of a text or texts and how to use them, like Ricky has said, that allows me to step back and to hear what all of them are saying, move around, and engage with them not so much in a way of uh, them getting the right idea of a concept I want them to learn, but to at least help them plug some gaps and consider directions that they need to head in. Um, and then in the end, it's not so much that they're going to have a correct understanding of a concept, but they're going to be able to produce a written product that shows a high level of engagement with the text. That's the goal that we're working toward, not necessarily a, uh, a positivistic goal of uh, they get a concept or they do not. No, actually, on, on this Mentimeter, we do have a lot of questions. I, I want to make time to at least address one of them. Now, this, uh, this point was saying it seems difficult and complex to make preparation, isn't it? Uh, it's not directing, it's not specified whether it's for teachers or for, for students, but we have teachers here. I think for both teachers and students, we will have this kind of preparation thing. So relating to that, I'm, I'm thinking, um, when you are preparing uh, a more traditional way of teaching before and now in flip, uh, flipping flipped classroom, is it more demanding? And how often do you update your materials for, you know, uh, videos or materials like that, and is that more demanding than the usual way of designing? Sorry, can I try and answer? Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for the person who ever posted that um, question. Um, I think the, the two key things that I have to remember is I like to try and run a version of the simulation two or three times before I say the simulation's really done. Because I have to figure out, have I pitched it too hard? So for example, dealing with the famine the conflict-related problems, um, all the issues in the question of South Sudan. I made an error the first time assigning a team where the students were like, really, this is too hard to get data. What really is Ethiopia's foreign policy? And we spent a lot of time working together trying to figure that out and doing that, and I thought, uh, 
I set the bar perhaps a little bit too far. Um, so I like to try and run it a couple of times. So yes, there is that upfront cost. And of course, there is an upfront cost every time you do this because you have to hang on till week five, where I believe at Hong Kong U, the ad drop period is done, which means you can't really put together the class teams until you're about to actually hand out the simulation in week six. But I do think there is a big payoff though because when I'm able to transition away from more traditional teaching methods, it is far more gratifying watching the students work out how they're going to learn versus having me tell them you are now going to do X, Y, and Z as negotiators. Um, so yes, there is an upfront cost, but I'm learning now how to try and avoid paying the upfront costs that are pointless. So again, I try to run it one, two, three times before I shelve it and start a new one. So. Thank you very much. There's a, another question posted in the in-class elements section, which is what are the limitations of a flipped classroom approach? So you, have, you all have experiences. What, what do you think about the limitation of it? Um, so uh, for my personal um, experience of medical students is I think one of the limitations is that there will always be a small number of students that will not take to flip classroom, um, especially for the medical um, students because they know that they've got exams and there's a question bank which uh, we all suspect they actually have a lot of questions too and they just want to pass the exams. They're not really interested in engaging the material further. They just feel that as long as they qualify as doctors, they can deal with the real life scenario later, basically. So um, I think that's one of the limitations of flip classroom. You always have some detractors. Um, yeah. Um, I think we got some questions specifically relating to specific teachers. Um, this one, Sam Cole. This is a question directly to you. How to set down the basis of interpretation before students' groups can start working in humanities? That's a good question. A lot of our teaching is very genre-driven. And before we actually ask students to get into discussing uh, the, the pre-lesson readings that they've done, we'll show them an example of the type of text that we're looking for them to produce after their discussion. For example, in a history course, we give them a short primary source uh, for the pre-lesson reading, and the idea is that they are going to need to explicate this text uh, and, and show what's, what's, what's between the lines here in this text. When they come to class, we'll have a parallel task, typically a shorter text, a short primary text, have them look at it together. Uh, what jumps out at you here? What do you see between the lines? so that they, they get an idea of how that discussion can work on a shorter, on a smaller scale, and then show them a professional's piece of writing where uh, typically an, an academic has interpreted that text so that they can see how someone else has taken a, a reading that's similar to what they've done before the lesson and, and picked it apart and, and shown how they've picked it apart in their own writing. I think one of the key things that, that is linked up and perhaps answers that question is what students want to see is an exemplar. So when I do my debriefing with the whole class, I'm the exemplar disseminating that information. In Ricky's class, it's the exemplar of the best student case or the model answer that they see and they compare theirs to. Somebody else also had, we choose the best student response and we critique and give feedback on that. I think if you don't have an exemplar, I think students feel a bit shortchanged. And so they do want to know what is the goal and what to aim for. So I think somewhere we do need to have some affirmation uh, about what it is that they're aiming for. And I think that's a key ingredient somewhere in the flipped classroom that needs to be a, a key ingredient. Yeah. So we also have another question. Because normally when we flip class, one of the things is we have a really big class. No, this is a question to Ricky and Andrea. How to measure student in-class engagement? So as we try, we want to know the effectiveness of it. So how do we measure it? And how large is your teaching team? Uh, it's a, to me, it's a, it's a billion dollar question. <laughs> how to measure engagement? Because 
I, I tend to, when I, when I see a question like this, I tend to think very, very deep, like, uh, what, what actually do we mean by learning? Right? What happens in our brain? Right? How do we define that? Right? That kind of stuff. And I always immediately need to fall back to a, you know, a conventional or, or like a second best or third best solution, which is just to take the empirical evidence. Like, okay, I, I very much like uh, Matthew's way of put, putting it uh, is the measurement of happiness. Uh, it seems to me that everybody is very happy and they are energetic, they, they fight for their grace and they care very much about this very tiny bit of uh, assessment points that they are getting in a, in a classroom. Uh, and so that would be one way, very, very uh, you know, non-scientific way of measuring engagement. And one concrete way that we measure eng engagement is to look at their, their video reports after each class. And we, we look at specific person's role. So usually students really need to discuss uh, how do we divide up our workload? How, how should I uh, perform in this video? And because we require specifically every student to be in the video, in the reporting. Everyone has to say something. And we, we have rubrics for that. So that would, again, just a very indirect way of measuring engagement. I, I don't really have a scientific way of of gauging engagement. And about the teaching team, uh, actually it's not that big. The first time I offered this last academic year, it was quite big because I was super nervous, very anxious. So I pulled together a lot of people that I can get uh, just to give me this psychological support. But now it just comes down to maybe three or four persons. We can pull off like 120 students uh, classroom. So it's not really a, a huge requirement, I, I would say. Andrea, do you have any supplement? Um, I think not really on the measure the engagement, but we are, what we are trying to do is like in the presentation, when I talk about uh, maximize the quality time. So by engaging students, we really want them to understand that whatever you're doing in the class is enough. So by flipping the classroom, you watch a lecture and you come to do the classwork and it's enough. You don't have to take any extra work back home. So that is the way, the one way that we try to engage them so they're committed, they understand that this is, you are doing something in my benefit. And that's another way. So I think in terms of the measurement of engagement, apart from the happiness, it's also this trust between us and the students that they trust that we have their best interest in mind and they also give us the best response, best feedback, best effort. And then that's the, the, the very direct way to look at engagement. It's great that we're setting a high bar for the flipped classroom by we're saying, how do you measure the engagement? Because what do you do with a lecture? You take attendance. You've got no idea what's going on in their minds. You've no idea whether they're, well, you can see when they're asleep. Uh, but you know, for lectures, we have such a low standard. But for the flipped classroom, we're setting a high one. Very good. Keep it up. I, I have a little trick that I, I use in my class. When I, when I get the students to discuss something, I use what's known as a dialogue sheet. I give them a big sheet of paper and they have to write on that piece of paper, so four people, three people writing on the same piece of paper at the same time. And then I collect those at the end of the class. It's a, it's a record of who's there and it's also a record of how much they have engaged in the class. And I, I get them to just write their names on it. Um, I don't think we should measure these things too formally. I don't think that's useful to us. Right, but I do think it's part of the teaching craft to be able to look at a classroom and know which, which tables are active and which tables are not active. And you're always going to have one group that gets to the answer immediately and then just sits or folds their arms and, you know, done. Um, and to be able to help all the different groups with their learning, whatever their learning uh, challenges are. Yes, it has that advantage uh, as well that uh, we... Uh, get to experience closely with students their learning, which cannot be achieved in the same way in a lecture. We, the problems are raised, the obstacles are, are identified, and hints or help is given by the teacher or by the students along the way. Uh, this doesn't happen in a lecture, it cannot happen. So and just, just to add on to, um, I also, you know, using a similar method like Matthew, but we do independent Feedback. So you have just one, one form, three questions. What did you do during today's session? 
So literally four or five bullet points. I was team A, I negotiated with teams B, C, and D. I met this objective. Okay, what's your plan for the next session we meet up? I'm gonna try and chase team B to extract greater concessions. Do you have any problems? Yes, I don't understand how come X, Y, or Z is happening. What's, what can you do to help me? And so we have that sort of feedback after every lecture, after every tutorial. So there's four of these sheets that we can then work with, you know, whether we're doing it via email, in person, or at the next class. So we have that sort of way to try and figure out if they're engaged or if they're sort of completely lost during the whole session of negotiating. So guys, I'm very aware of time, so I'm sorry I have to stop here. I, uh, I invite Susan, Dr. Susan Bridges, to give up a, as a closing today. I won't stand in front of colleagues. Um, Thank you very much for inviting me to wrap up a very complex actual set of ideas and practices. But first of all, congratulations, because as Professor Ian Holliday said, this is actually truly a grassroots movement, okay? So these are innovators, practitioners who are trying out new things, experimenting, sometimes failing. You know, we don't always stand here and say, I just got the best X and the best Y. I tried something and I learnt from it. It didn't work this well, but I'm going to pick up and move forward. So um, first of all, bravo to all our colleagues for sharing their practice. So thank you very much. I think on, on reflecting on, on today and some of the larger um, experiences I've been in in the last uh, year, I think that um, why flipping <laughs> has a question that came up to a few folk. And I was thinking in a, in a larger perspective about liquid modernity, etc. The notions of the new students, the new times. What are the key challenges? Speed, complexity, uncertainty. How do we prepare our students for living in a world that is faster? They're saying, I don't have time for boring lectures anymore. Give it to me faster. But do we lose something if we're giving it to them faster? So they're, in a way, flipped classrooms are reacting to these issues of speed, complexity, information on demand, complexities, uncertainties. I don't know what my future will be when I leave university because the job market, the types of positions change. How do we prepare students for an uncertain future? Okay? And so I think that there's a reactive element where we're seeing colleagues work with these notions of addressing impatient students, how do you slow them down? How do you make them engage with content in a deep fashion? So we're talking about deep learning. This was coming through so much in the conversations. Not surface approaches and sure, let's, let's you know, produce content, have them memorise, that, that MCQ is done in the moment and then we move on. But how do you actually engage students in deep inquiry, and that's, some, that's a thread that I saw across all of these presentations. So how do we maximise the face-to-face -face moment without burdening our students and say, great, now I can put double the content into my course because I can throw all my lectures, you know, the old lectures are up online, and then I can do even more work with them in class. That's not really the point, is it? The point our colleagues here have been sharing with us is, okay, I've, I've got the core principles, the core concepts, that's being covered in terms of my, my key content for my, for my uh, discipline, but then my face-to-face, -face, how do I exploit that the best by using all of these different approaches? And so I think that engaging our students in inquiry, in deep inquiry, face-to-face, -face, and building community. I think one of, for me, arriving at Hong Kong U 10 years ago as one of the centenary recruits, when um, a, a survey was done of our first year students, why do you come to university? To meet other students. So we're not trying to do the old replace with the virtual. Our students come to campus to create community and to create community with our colleagues as well. And so many of them have responded to, I really enjoy the personal of actually engaging with my academic professor, tutor, instead of standing out having them stand on the stage, as we've heard so many, of, so many times, I'm engaging with this person and discussing ideas and exploring. Uh, I think the challenges for us as institutions and for colleagues here who are curriculum leaders 
where to now we have grassroots at class course level activity happening. How do we rethink our programs? And that's a big challenge. Um, I've got colleagues here from education. We just redesigned one taught postgraduate program. It took us about three years. <laughs> okay, so these things are time consuming. You have to also build your academic community of colleagues. Next year, as part of the Universitas 21 work we do with the education subcluster, we're hosting a meeting of curriculum leaders, vice um, presidents, pro vice chancellors, directors, and we're going to be talking about the new curriculum models, the next era. So this sort of grassroots input of what colleagues are doing in their classes to help us to understand how they're struggling with these issues of speed, complexity and uncertainty in modern times are fantastic. So congratulations to Ricky and Rick, to our wonderful presenters for a fabulous, um, inspiring practice-based day. And, uh, and once again, thank you for sharing your practice so honestly. Thank you to everyone. Yeah, yeah, I can't.